This is impossible! The SCP site director wasn't normally a calm or cheerful man, but the researcher had rarely seen him as angry as he was right now. His face turned a deep beet red as he scanned the documents on his desk before he asked how months of valuable research on this subject had suddenly gone blank. The data was completely gone. The researcher gulped nervously, hoping a demotion wasn't in his future, and nodded. How could this be possible? This was an experienced researcher who should have been taking all of the necessary precautions. Could the being they were studying somehow have erased all these documents himself? That's just what the researcher had been trying to find out for months, with hours and hours spent trying to learn the extent of its abilities. Well, where are they? The site director asked. I want everything you have! The researcher dropped a printout of their research on the mysterious subject's abilities on the director's desk. Every relevant line read, Data Lost. The director let out a deep sigh. He wanted to hear everything the researcher knew. Well, everything he could remember, at least, from the beginning. The researcher sat down and began to relay everything he could about SCP-343, which some of the other researchers had started to refer to by the nickname, God. SCP-343 was first sighted in Prague, just an unassuming older man wandering the streets. He seemed completely normal to everyone who passed him by, until he decided he was tired of staying on the ground. An SCP agent stationed in the area noticed the old man disappear from the streets, as if he was blinking out of existence, only to appear on a rooftop nearby. The local SCP teams were marshaled, and they had soon tracked down what seemed to be a very powerful specimen. But SCP-343 didn't seem concerned. He reacted calmly when detained by the Foundation and went with them willingly. He was detained in a standard holding cell for interrogation and examination, but he seemed completely at ease with his sudden confinement. It would soon become clear that this ordinary old man was anything but. Doctors Beck and Nidlovu was brought in to consult on the SCP's classification, and that's when the first anomalies began. Their assessments matched initially, but when it came time to describe him physically, things took a strange turn. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features. Caucasian in appearance. Dr. Nidlovu was confused by what Dr. Beck was describing in his report. This man was clearly black. The two doctors quarreled, unable to square their differing perceptions. They decided to bring in a third impartial view to settle it, their fellow researcher Dr. Wan. She didn't take long before coming back with her assessment. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features, Asian in appearance, possibly Chinese. Whatever SCP-343 was, he seemed to be perceived by each staff member as close in appearance to their own race. But that was only the start of the anomalies surrounding the old man in the holding cell. Dr. Beck started making regular visits to the mysterious man, and in their first interview, he asked the old man who he was and how he came by his abilities. The old man had a simple response. I created the universe. Dr. Beck stifled a laugh and decided to indulge the old man's delusion. It was a fascinating claim, but could he prove it? Without another word, SCP-343 got up from his chair, laughed, and turned around and walked through the solid wall in the holding cell and disappeared. Dr. Beck was about to hit the panic button and marshal the facility's security to find him when the strange man reappeared, walking through the solid wall. The only thing that was different? He was holding a hamburger, which he sat down and enjoyed. The facility quickly went on lockdown, and a full investigation was done into how SCP-343 breached containment. But there was no evidence of any security breach, no failures in containment, and no evidence of any other cells failing. SCP-343 hadn't broken through the security, he had just ignored it, as if it wasn't there at all. When questioned about how he had gone on his hamburger run, he simply repeated his belief that he was God, in between bites of his fast food treat. This would be far from the only time strange things happened around SCP-343. SCP containment cells are as secure as they need to be, but even the least strict containment isn't known for its decor. Which is why Dr. Beck was in for a surprise the next time he paid visit to SCP-343. The bare-bones cell now looked like a comfortable home, decorated in old English fashions. The scientists assumed that SCP-343 had been making many more trips out of his cell to get accessories to feel more at home. But that didn't explain all the changes to the cell. 
No one could explain how he had installed the roaring fireplace in the containment cell, and everyone who entered could swear the cell looked many times bigger than any other cell in the facility. SCP-343 wasn't just breaking containment. He now seemed to be breaking the laws of physics in the facility. The rules of the SCP containment facility didn't seem to be a concern to SCP-343, but there was one thing he didn't seem to want to do, escape. After every sudden exit, he would always return to his personal cell and treat it as his home. When interviewed by staff members, he was polite but vague, and everyone seemed to enjoy talking to him. It was decided to keep him on site, not attempt to increase his security, but restrict access and keep his room guarded at all times to ensure only researchers with level 3 access and above were allowed to meet with him. But God works in mysterious ways. Minimal Security Site 17 was one of the least restrictive SCP containment sites, hosting anomalies that could be safely contained and weren't likely to mount violent escapes. But as in every SCP facility, security was still taken seriously and only those with proper clearance could interact with the subjects. So why did SCP-343 seem impossible to guard? While only level 3 clearance and above were allowed in, the guards assigned to protect the entrance all seemed to fall down on the job. Security Officer James, who was supposed to be keeping people out of SCP-343's cell, had instead let in multiple visitors, in addition to dropping in several times himself. When questioned on why he had gone against orders and done so, he simply replied that 343 seemed lonely and was so happy every time he got company that it just seemed like the right thing to do. The security guard was reassigned and new ones were brought in, but history repeated itself. Guards were given stricter instructions to minimize exposure, but SCP-343's presence always seemed to influence them anyway. His containment cell was a revolving door, with staff members at the facility entering regularly for friendly conversations. Dr. Beck decided it was time to take matters into his own hands. He would meet with SCP-343 one-on-one -on -one and express how dangerous these security breaches were. He would try to convince the mysterious being that he needed to stop influencing the minds of the guards watching him, or the facility would have to look into new measures to contain him. Dr. Beck entered the containment cell and had a long conversation with SCP-343, and when he emerged, he had a big smile on his face like he had just finished a reunion with an old friend. He gave the current guard a friendly clap on the back and told him not to worry so much about security. After all, nothing bad was gonna happen from letting people at the facility visit SCP-343, right? He wasn't dangerous in any way. He also said that security should bring him anything he requests so he would feel less need to leave his cell. Minimal Security Site-17 soon became a model SCP facility with morale being the highest of any site, with most giving the credit to the presence of SCP-343. Employees generally make daily visits to his chamber, and he seems to have an encyclopedic knowledge of anything they want to talk about, including things he should have no way of knowing. Guards no longer quit their posts or break protocol, as their only real duty is to keep track of who meets with SCP-343 so they can be interviewed and debriefed after. Everyone's conversation is different, but they all report being in a better mood after leaving than when they came in. No further information is available on SCP-343's origins, the full extent of his powers, or whether he is telling the truth about being the god who created the universe. The site director rubbed his temples after hearing the researcher's explanation. So what you're telling me is that we have an uncontained, highly powerful SCP that has not only been breaking containment whenever it wants, but has managed to destroy all the files regarding the research on it. The researcher's answer was yes. However, the situation at Site-17 seemed to be stable, and they had come up with a plan that should help to maximize the positive effect SCP-343 has on the facility. They were even hypothesizing that staff from other sites and even certain anomalies could be pacified by 343's presence. The site director wasn't impressed though. He wanted the researcher to go back to the drawing board and redo the research. After all, if all the files were blank, how could they ever learn how to properly contain it? That's what the C and SCP stood for after all, containment. The researcher finally had to stand to the director though and told them that it wasn't a good idea that they had already tried everything to contain SCP-343, but that it wasn't that he broke containment. It was as if he didn't even acknowledge that an attempt had been made to contain him. He was omnipotent, aware of things he shouldn't, 
and able to do things that broke the laws of physics without breaking a sweat. There was no evidence that this was God, the creator of the universe as he claimed to be, but there also wasn't any evidence yet to conclusively prove he wasn't. The researcher's best guess was that this was a powerful reality bender whose abilities knew no limits, and that the only reason he was staying in the facility was because he wanted to, and doing anything to change that might cause him to change his benevolent ways. The director sighed. As much as he hated to admit it, his researcher was making good points. He wanted to meet SCP-343 personally, but did he need to know anything first? Well, sir, the researcher replied, he likes hamburgers, but beyond that, he'll take care of the rest. He's right there where we left him, in his home, waiting for his next guest. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people, computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles. Its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the Tentacled God, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662, and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it. And nothing shall stand in their way. How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead, and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon, their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds, slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families, leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another. They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their rulers sent to them in their dreams. They worshiped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacled god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me and the new world I create shall be your playground. 
Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause, quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose. Infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of site administration with research authorization powers, and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Tau-9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them, and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the tentacled god, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that masked figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But, infiltrating the site was one thing. Getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, 
would attack the containment site head on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed, leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the Tentacle God's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the Tentacled God detonated explosives, creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways, so they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here, and that them murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. The cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him. He replied that he didn't need saving that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, the remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, who keeps him amused with video games and reading material while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. Following the termination of the devotees of the tentacled god, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept out.
A very strange anomaly sits in a humanoid containment cell in the minimum security wing of Site-17. He walks, talks, and looks like a man, but everything else is convoluted in a question mark. This is SCP-343, who, like his namesake, God, is likely to cause arguments whenever he's brought up. Is he the creator of all that exists, the basis for the Abrahamic faiths, or is he a pretender, a reality warper with immense power and predilection towards delusion, a courtesan of the House of Maladrog, Matthew, Methuselah, Yahweh, who knows? Really, it depends on who you ask and which stories you choose to believe. And few people enjoy a good story more than SCP-343 himself. If one day you take the time to visit him in his room and ask him to reveal a page in the long book of his personal history, he might be kind enough to tell you a story. A story like this, of an encounter with something monstrous that few others could hope to survive meeting face to face. Rewind a few thousand years. Nobody knows how many, exactly. God, as he chooses to dub himself, walked across the cracked ground on worn sandals. It'd been some time since he'd seen an animal around here, and even longer since he'd seen a human being. Not that this bothered him. He'd never been bothered by his own company on a long walk like this. Of course, he could have sped up time or teleported, but where was the fun in that? He was a tourist in the world of sensation, of experience, of flesh, bone, dirt, blood, and sand. After all, where's the fun in creating a whole universe if you can't drop in now and then to visit and do as the Romans do? Not that the Romans would be around for another few thousand years. Even Atlas must occasionally shift the weight of the globe from his shoulders for a jaunt around the cosmic neighborhood and whatever passes for fresh air in the vacuum. God whistled a tune to himself. It was a craggy, mountainous region he'd found himself in. The distant peaks had frosted caps, a breathtaking place where many truly had their breaths taken away. How humans will so happily risk their lives to do something extraordinary. It never ceased to amaze him. His stomach rumbled. Oh, how he enjoyed that sensation. One of the funny little quirks of this human form that he weaved for himself. It was no reason to be concerned, if memory served, from his last trip through the area a few decades before. There was a friendly village not far from here. They had always accepted him as a genial stranger, having no knowledge of his true power. God had always believed that a person's goodness is defined by how they treat those from whom they had nothing to gain. So it caused him great concern as he approached the village and saw great plumes of smoke rising into the sky. He was so shocked by this that he could decide to break his rule about walking as a man in case there was still some way he could help. With a snap of his fingers, he disappeared and reappeared in the center of the village's town square. Total devastation. Huts and houses had been torn asunder. Broken weapons lay on the ground. Some places were on fire, others smeared with streaks of blood, like some terrible battle had occurred here. But something was wrong. No bodies, not one, from defender or assailant. How could a thriving village be so thoroughly destroyed and not leave a single corpse? It was an act so bizarre and depraved that it left even God puzzling. That was another downside of his human form. Here on Earth, he didn't have access to true omniscience. How could a mere human mind, bound by the constraints of linear time, ever truly comprehend the total of existence? Even attempting to do that here would melt the brain of his human body in its skull and leave it dribbling out of his nose and ears. Instead, he chose to walk around the ruins of the village and investigate firsthand. Arrows and broken spears and swords littered the ground. Some buildings were demolished, but there were no tracks or stray projectiles that could suggest the presence of siege weapons. No, these buildings looked like they were ripped apart. Some even still had claw marks. What terrible beast could have set upon this town and done this? Then he heard a voice, quiet and pleading beneath some nearby rubble. A survivor. He rushed over to the pile and evaporated it with a thought. Underneath, a feeble old man, covered in stone dust, was quivering. God helped him up and guided him into one of the few remaining huts still standing in the village. They both took seats. God held up two hands, cradling empty space. Two cups suddenly occupied that space, both filled with warm, healing tea. 
He passed the old man one of the cups while sipping from his own. He asked the old man if he'd seen what had happened. The old man told him no, he hadn't seen anything in decades. He'd been rendered blind in his youth. Little did either of them know, that very blindness was the only reason he was the sole survivor of the massacre. The blind man told God that one of the village's scouts had gone up into the mountain with a small hunting party. The group was gone for days, until one of the members, the youngest among them, returned weeping, frostbitten, and covered in blood. He said that his friends had been killed by a beast in the mountains, something that almost looked like a man, but terribly wrong. And its face, its awful, awful face, he would never forget it. He was just lucky to escape with his life when the others were torn apart. But when the young man returned, he'd brought the shadow of death with him. It was a curse that doomed the entire village, men, women, and children, to a terrible fate. And that fate was upon them a mere hour after the survivor had returned. Of course, there were gaps in the blind man's understanding, given he was lacking one of his major senses. But the sounds he could describe with perfect clarity. It was faint and distant at first, that awful wail and the galloping, hands and feet thundering against the ground faster than any horse could move, getting closer and closer. Another villager saw it approaching and screamed. Then it was upon them. The villagers screamed, but it screamed louder, always wailing and shrieking and sobbing like a monster crawling straight up from hell. People tried to fight it by the sounds of it, the blind man, with teary, blank eyes, recalled the sounds of arrows knocking and swords clashing against something. But even their greatest warriors had screamed and died. Those who saw it and tried to flee and hide were slaughtered all the same. Soon enough, there were only two sounds left in the village. The monster and the blind man, both weeping. He didn't understand why it never took him. It wasn't fair. It took everything else. To leave him here alive when everyone and everything he'd ever known was destroyed was a greater punishment than even death. After killing all of these innocents, the monster had simply wandered off to the mountains again, the sound of its quiet sobs getting smaller and smaller until it was gone altogether. God comforted the blind man as he wept for the loss of all his loved ones. He told the blind man that he would venture up to the mountains himself and confront the creature on its own territory, and at the very least, find out why it had done this terrible thing. But first, he must relocate the blind man to a safer place. He placed a hand on the blind man's shoulder and he vanished. He would appear in another friendly village miles away. God sent a silent message into the minds of every villager. Take good care of this man. He has undergone horrors you can't even imagine. Your kindness will be rewarded later. For that, you have my promise." God sighed and turned his tired eyes to the distant mountains. A monster lurked up there, perhaps one of his own creations, or maybe a corruption of one of his creations. Either way, whatever existed without his knowledge existed without his consent and he intended to know of the beast in the mountains. Though given what he'd seen already, he didn't expect to receive a warm welcome from this murderous demon. Miles away up in the mountains, the creature licked the blood from its cracked lips. It looked like it might have once been a human being or something that aspired to humanity or mocked it with its very existence. It was a huge, gangling beast, Skin alablaster, eyes empty and soulless, dribbling rivulets of burning tears down a hideous, gaunt face. It crawled into the frozen mouth of a cave with great icicle fangs, wheezing and weeping. All it ever wanted was to be alone. Why did they have to keep interfering? Didn't they know what happened? All the terrible things they made it do. The creature curled its long, gangly body into the fetal position scratching great ruts into the sides of its bald cranium with long, sharp fingers. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And then there was a brilliant flash just a few feet away. The monster was surprised. It turned to see a figure silhouetted in the mouth of the cave. He wore sandals and thin robes. His eyes glowed with a kind of power that the monster didn't recognize. This stranger stared at the monster without an ounce of fear in his heart. He stared right into its eyes, unwavering. 
No, 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 no! He could feel it again, the rage bubbling up deep down. A cauldron of seething anger, it hated the feeling like being lowered into a vat of molten metal. Unspeakable fire and pain coursing through every vessel. He began to weep and scream while the stranger in the cave mouth just watched, not moving a muscle. Do you know who I am? The stranger asked with a deep voice that betrayed almost infinite power, knowledge, and wisdom. But it wouldn't change the outcome here. The monster bounded at him at speeds that wouldn't be seen again until jet planes and bullet trains are invented millennia into the future. Its jaws were hanging impossibly wide, fangs born, its arms extended and deadly claws ready to strike. But before those terrible hands could close around the stranger, he vanished. The monster stumbled and rolled across the snow, confused. What trickery was being used here? I'll take that as a no, said the voice from behind him. You ought to show your father some respect. More respect than you gave to those poor people down in the village, at least. Seething, the creature turned and saw the stranger standing back in the darkness of the cave, staring at him. But the beast didn't have the capacity for awe or holy terror. Only violence. Boundless, limitless, unstoppable violence. It darted towards the stranger again, trying to strike him. Somehow it was like fighting an empty robe. Not a single one of its deadly strikes seemed to hit the stranger. The stranger leaped backwards, putting some space between himself and the monster, but still not breaking a sweat. He breathed in deeply, then exhaled. The breath came out like a mighty typhoon, shocking even the monster with its sudden force. It was blown backwards a leaf in the wind, until its long claws dug into the ground and anchored it in place. The stranger gave a wry smile at this, impressed. My, my, you're certainly a tenacious one, aren't you? He said. Perhaps we can talk for a little while instead of fighting. I want to know why you killed all those people. No answer. The beast roared, its mighty limbs pounding into the ground as it closed the gap between itself and the stranger in fractions of a second. It would kill him, rend him, destroy him just like all the others. He'd left it no choice. Suddenly the ground below it seemed to give way. The creature was confused. It looked down to see that the ancient stone below had somehow taken on the properties of a liquid, and it was sinking. The beast panicked and it began to thrash. It was a strong swimmer, but it didn't expect to need to swim here. The shock was too much, and soon the ground submerged it entirely, muffling its terrible roars and shrieks. And just like that, the ground was solid again, trapping the beast inside. The stranger stepped forward and looked at the ground. A much needed time out, he said. You do yourself no good struggling like this. Despite its terrible capacity for evil, God couldn't help but admire the beast, at least on the level of construction. It was so pared down, so unburdened, a killer to the core but seemingly unkillable. Had he made this creature? Billions of species and the species those in turn had created through billions of years of breeding and evolution, and somewhere along the line, this thing happened. It was easy even for the universe's creator to lose track of some of the tinier variables. And in the grand scheme of things, even this monster was still a tiny variable. But right here, right now, it was still one hell of a problem. The ground rumbled below God. Cracks formed. The mountain peak shook. God raised an eyebrow, genuinely impressed, as the monster ripped free of its stone prison and re-entered the fray. It roared and screamed still its blank eyes fixed on him, its skeletal body throbbed and heaved with power. Unlike any other creature in nature, it was almost like the longer their conflict went on, the more energized the beast became. God sighed. All those poor villagers. They never stood a chance against this monster. It lunged for him, even faster and stronger than before. He teleported out of the way in the nick of time, and the beast's claws cleaved through a nearby cave wall, effortless. God materialized nearby, but he didn't have time to speak. The beast lunged again and again and again. Every time he reappeared, the beast went for him with impossible speed. Deciding to widen the playing field, God teleported to the top of the mountain. The creature, somehow sensing his presence, vaulted upwards and tunneled through the roof of the cave. 
bursting out of the ground in front of God, who was floating just slightly off the ground. It would be wise of you to stop. God carefully intoned. All this time, you know, I've been going easy on you. You don't want to find out what the wrath of God looks like. Storm clouds were gathering above. Mighty thunder roared across the sky. The beast was undeterred. It roared and galloped towards God, and God in turn called down a response. A volley of lightning the likes of which the world has never seen before or since struck down on the charging monster. The sudden white flash could sting the eyes from miles away. The monster shrieked from the blast, feeling its flesh lift off its bones and atomize in the sheer heat of the electricity around it. It could smell itself cooking. The lightning blast only lasted for a few seconds, but for the beast, it felt like eternity. When the onslaught stopped, the air was still heavy with electrical potential. God stared down at the black scorch mark on the side of the mountain where the creature had been standing. All the snow within a mile had been evaporated by the blast. It was a raw display of the power of nature that would make even Zeus tremble in his sandals. And yet, there was still movement. Something started to get up from the burnt patch where nothing should be left alive. A blackened skeleton, rising shakily from the ash but still very much alive. As it started to rise, new flesh began growing over its bones little by little. Even God was astonished by the sight of it. He'd never seen a creature cling so ardently to life in spite of having truly unsurmountable power amassed against it. It was up against God, and still, it fought. The monster tottered on its freakishly long limbs, still disoriented, unusually staggered for a creature driven by such single-minded violent purpose. When enough of its face grew back to do so, it began to weep and sob again, tears streaking down its terrible face. Looking at this creature after all of this, God couldn't help but feel a new emotion, pity. He lowered himself to the ground and approached the creature, like none had ever done before. He gathered it up into his arms and he held it, feeling its heaving, wretched sobs against him. The beast was in so much pain, he could feel it radiating from within. Speak, my son. God said in a soft, fatherly voice. And for the first and only time, the monster spoke. Can you can see? <coughs> Make me a people. Own wonder people. Can look. Can look. Please. That was all it managed to choke out before devolving back into unintelligible babble. But. It was enough. Enough for God to understand its pain. He did not know if it would be right to change the monster's nature. Is it ever right to truly change anyone's nature? But it was within his almost limitless power to grant it one reprieve from pain. He settled the beast in the snow below him. It was quiet and still. And God said unto the beast, Rest now, child. Rest for thousands of years if you must. I hope only that when you eventually awaken, you feel differently. And so another story from the catalog of SCP-343. Of course, it leaves us with certain questions, mm. chief among them being, is it true? Did 343 and 096 have this chance encounter long ago? Or is this just another tall tale from an anomaly who fancies himself a deity? We have our truth, and you have yours. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. 
Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own sun. For reference, the sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001, on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. 
The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request, and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated, as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, and the researcher's site, as well as the researchers themselves, were immediately obliterated by an unknown force though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered. And according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked, and venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the Guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073, the anomaly otherwise known as Kane. Kane is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze, much like the Gate Guardian. SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Cain is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory. 
keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Cain was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Cain's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001, with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh God, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, The Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site-0. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site-0, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. The smell of fire and oil fills the air. The sound of gears grinding can be heard between the explosions and shrieks of terror. A man runs out of his house, only to have his leg grabbed by a metal arm and dragged back through his front door. SCP-001 leaves a trail of metal fragments and mechanical parts on the ground in the wake of its destruction. Iron chains swing from its form. Cast iron gears whirl within it. A glowing light throbs from the center of its body. SCP-001 is consuming everything in its path. After incorporating the truck chassis into its being, SCP-001 rolls in a lumbering fashion to the next house. It rips the gutters from the side of the building. Residents who live in the area flee their neighborhood, all the while hoping that the mechanical monstrosity skips over their house so they have something to return to if they make it out alive. A section of SCP-001's undercarriage drops away from the main body. It rolls down the street, consuming more and more material. The new entity resembles a human spine and rib cage. It topples over, unable to support itself. The rib-like formations extend out to grab anything and everything within reach. The newly incorporated material forms what can only be described as a head. Light from within the eye sockets fixate on nearby civilians. The metallic creature picks up the people and places them inside its exposed steel ribcage. Then it turns and spots a woman helplessly trying to crawl away. The creature reaches out with a spiked tentacle and wraps it around the woman's body. She is placed inside of the chest cavity. Moments later, a severed hand falls out of the entity and onto the ground. The mechanical monster continues to gather bodies and materials, incorporating them into its frame. A growth begins to slowly expand on its back. It becomes so massive that the creature falls over and uses its limbs to scurry to a nearby house. There is a sickening crunching sound as the growth bursts. From within emerges three humanoid creatures resembling the civilians that the entity had consumed earlier. 
A female with chains extending from her scalp like dreadlocks stumbles away. The second humanoid is a man with cogs for limbs. He examines the clock-like components that have been incorporated into his body, then stares blankly into the distance. The third humanoid lies motionless on the ground. He did not make it. The two functioning humanoids look at their creator intently. For a moment, nothing moves. Then, as if they have been given orders telepathically, the half-human, half-machine humanoids turn and run away from the mayhem. A few weeks before the massacre caused by what would be designated as SCP-001, the Foundation had been in contact with the Allied Occult Initiative. There were rumors of an anomalous object in Mexico being worshipped by a group of people who identified themselves as the Church of the Broken God. Intel about the church claimed their deity was a small mechanical box filled with cogs and pistons. The box supposedly had supernatural abilities. It was said to be able to communicate with congregants of the Church of the Broken God telepathically. The devout worshipped the box, following any order it gave, and in return they were filled with an emotion that could be only described as divine. As World War II rages on in Europe, the Foundation sends agents to recover anomalies in Mexico that might help with the war effort. While there, the Foundation force is tasked with learning about the Church of the Broken God. They are also ordered to investigate a town near La Paz, where there are troubling accounts of a mechanical anomalous creature causing mayhem. The agents make their way through Mexico, gathering various objects to bring back to Foundation sites in the United States. The unit loads all of the anomalies they recovered onto a train, with a plan to check out the stories of the mechanical anomaly they've heard about as they make their way to the U.S. border. The train heads north along rusted rails. Just outside La Paz, they've come across a broken-down train filled with what looks to be refugees. When the Foundation unit goes to investigate, they find all of the refugees repeating the same words over and over again, but they don't understand. The Foundation agents look at one another confused, until one of them translates the words into English. The words the refugees are saying over and over again are, La Machina the machine. The commanding officer orders a squad of Foundation agents to proceed up the tracks, to see if they can figure out what has the refugees so scared. They make their way towards La Paz, disappearing over the horizon. As the sun sets, the remaining Foundation agents hear gunshots in the distance. They stay awake all night, remaining vigilant, waiting for the exploratory squad, but morning comes without anyone returning. Three days later, the Foundation Force still has not seen anything since the exploratory squad left. Then, as the sun sits lazily in the morning sky, a lone figure is spotted walking down the tracks towards the trains. One of the agents on watch blows his whistle and points to the figure. A squad of agents rushes towards the shadow of a man. Their guns are raised, ready for anything. The figure drops to the ground and begins to crawl along the tracks. The agents reach the fallen man, only to find that he is one of their squad mates who has been sent up the tracks to investigate La Paz several days before. The agent's name is DeMarco. He is covered in blood. His clothes are in tatters and he has lost a boot. DeMarco lies on his back with Foundation agents standing around him. His eyes are wide and wild. He keeps babbling on about a world eater, how the rest of his squad had been mulched, and he is the only one who made it out alive. The Foundation agents carry DeMarco back to the makeshift base they created by the trains. They need to figure out a way to get the convoy moving again, but whatever is up ahead has already taken out an entire Foundation squad. It had to be something anomalous, but what could it possibly be? The unit of Foundation agents prepare to move towards La Paz. They start loading their rifles and check the amount of ammunition and explosives available in case the containment process gets out of hand. Just as they are about to leave the base, a convoy appears on the horizon. It is an allied occult initiative force preparing to attack whatever it is that is devastating La Paz. This organization's mission is to not secure, contain, or protect, but to destroy. The Foundation may be in over their heads on this one, and the joint force with the Allied Occult Initiative may be the only way to stop what is now known as SCP-001. The AOI and Foundation force gears up for battle. They set out for La Paz, and what they find causes them to quake with fear. SCP-001 has consumed so much material, it is the size of a mountain. It moves like a tidal wave of mechanical destruction, washing over the buildings and landscape under it. Whatever SCP-001 passes over is consumed and added to its massive body. SCP-001 started as a small mechanical box with cogs, but now has morphed into a gigantic metal death machine. The Church of the Broken God has finally met their maker, 
as the small entity they once worshipped has now consumed all of its members. Their god is an all-consuming monster. The AOI and Foundation forces do everything they can to stop SCP-001 from continuing its reign of destruction. They fire barrage after barrage of bullets and explosives into the mechanical anomaly. They bring in air support to try and damage it from the skies, but nothing works. The AOI uses an artifact in their possession to lure SCP-001 to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, where a trap has been set for the so-called god. The monstrous mechanical creature moves slowly towards the water. It consumes abandoned cars, buildings, and boats as it approaches the coastline. It even shovels large amounts of earth into its form, causing flames to spurt out from its inner workings. Smoke bellows from openings between different mechanical components, like a volcano before it is about to erupt. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a massive cloud with a reddish tint appears in the sky. Air raid sirens can be heard in the distance. The enormous cloud begins to pulsate. Streaks of lightning shoot through the red mist in the sky. It now sits directly over SCP-001. From within the cloud, part of a ship can be seen. It appears to be slightly damaged. Electricity flows over its hull. The vessel in the giant red cloud is classified as SCP-2399. The underside of the vessel begins to glow aqua blue. A blinding beam of light is ejected from SCP-2399, which penetrates straight down and through SCP-001. For a moment, everything is still. There is complete silence. Then, as if SCP-001 is trying to reach up and grab the vessel above it, a mechanical bulge reaches out. Before SCP-001 can grab the vessel above, there is another bright flash of light. SCP-2399 blinks out of existence. The sound of grinding gears can be heard coming from within SCP-001. It begins to shed its outer layers of metal. Then, the entire structure that was SCP-001 collapses into the water and onto the beach. Giant cogs fall from the sky. Parts of vehicles embed themselves in the sand. As the Foundation and AOI agents approach the piles of scrap metal and mechanical components, they see that some of them are still moving. It is as if an invisible power source is still pulsating through some of the machinery. The agents of the Foundation celebrate the destruction of the giant mechanical beast, but little do they know this was only a piece of the entity worshipped as the Broken God. The Foundation agents collect as many of the still-moving parts as they can. They find spinning gears, twitching pulleys, and firing pistons. As the parts are separated from one another and carried away from the main wreckage of SCP-001, they slowly stop moving and become inactive. Some of the artifacts recovered were identified as being connected to the Church of the Broken God. These artifacts are found closer to the middle of what was once a mountain-sized SCP-001. Hundreds of anomalous artifacts are collected and transported to SCP Foundation sites. Collecting the broken parts of SCP-001 is relatively safe. However, some agents get too close to the larger moving parts, getting caught in them and losing a body part or two. But most agents proceed with caution and survive the collection ordeal with their arms and legs still attached to their bodies. Dive teams are sent into the water to recover parts that have sunk to the bottom of the sea. One of the divers is a local from the area. He is hired to bring up the heart of the machine, since he is an experienced diver used to freediving to great depths to collect oysters from the bottom of the bay. The diver enters the water and swims down into the murky depths. He secures straps around the heart of SCP-001 and pulls hard on the rope, as an indication to the surface that it is ready to be hauled up. The salvage team on the surface begins to pull. There is a second slight tug on the rope, then it goes slack. The team continues to pull. When they get the heart to the surface, they are horrified at what else comes up with it. Tangled in the ropes is the lifeless body of the diver. His head is smashed between two moving pieces of the heart. It looks as if he shoved his head between the slabs of metal himself. The salvage team untangles the body, rolls it off the deck, and back into the ocean. The mechanical box which was the heart of SCP-001 is offloaded on the shore, but as the Foundation prepares to move it to a containment facility, the weather starts to deteriorate. Hurricane-force wind sweeps across the water and batter the coast. The heart is kept in a secured storage warehouse until it can be moved. The people living in the village nearby complain of hearing voices and rashes so itchy that they practically tear their skin off. Once the storm passes, the Foundation agents load the heart onto a ship, it is to be transported to a Foundation site just across the border. The ocean seems calm and serene. 
the Foundation ship undocks and begins its journey up the coast. Not too long after beginning its journey, the ship slowly drifts off course. It is as if the crew has stopped manning their posts, and the ship is being controlled by a mind of its own. The Foundation ship crashes and sinks somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. And most importantly, the heart of SCP-001 doesn't make it to the Foundation site. Years later, a man is walking along the beach. He hears something. It sounds like someone pounding on a large drum to the rhythm of a heartbeat. The man walks towards the sound. Something is drawing him forward, closer and closer to the heartbeat. He walks and walks until the beating stops. He bends down and moves the sand aside. He spots the corner of a mechanical box sticking out of the white sand. The man digs deeper and pulls out the small box. Inside, he can see gears whirling and pistons firing. He holds the box close to his own heart. It seems to speak to him. The man brings the box back to town. He starts to worship the box and soon more and more people in the area join the new religion. They cast aside their own beliefs and focus on the powerful entity contained within the box. God is not dead, at least not yet. But the prophecies of the Church of the Broken God say that when the heart is found, the God will reassemble itself once again. Then the unbroken God will destroy all other false deities until only he remains. Corpses littered the facility, around 20 in total. Their massacre had unfolded in a matter of seconds despite their advanced armor and heavy weaponry. Their killer, wielding an ancient sword he'd somehow pulled from thin air, looked upon them with disdain. Weak, unworthy opponents. He breathed heavily. His torso was covered with bullet wounds and many had punctured his lungs. It was enough to kill a normal man ten times over, but not him. He was the ultimate warrior, the perfect killing machine. He would need to seek out an enemy more fitting for his legendary combat skills. He fled from the chamber into a connecting hallway, where a giant metal door slammed shut behind him. At the other end of a hall, another door did the same. He laughed at the thought of someone thinking he could be trapped so easily and charged towards it. But then, large valves began to open all around him. Torrents of freezing seawater began pouring in, filling up the chamber and submerging him before he could reach the door. The warrior fought for breath, and he held it far longer than any mortal man could, especially considering the state of his lungs. But water always wins. He soon gave his last gasp and floated, lifeless in the hallway. And soon after, his body turned to dust and disappeared in the briny water. But he would be back. He'd always be back. His brother was a different story. Tall and handsome, with a strange Sumerian rune tattooed on his forehead. He was practically a pacifist and spent most of his days reading, conversing with the staff and wandering the facility of his own accord. Upon hearing of the latest incident at the facility, he gave a sigh. He knew on some level that all of this was his fault. It'd been centuries, millennia even, but was it too late to make things right? Six days later, the two are standing face to face. This meeting had been a long time coming, but it was always destined to end in blood and pain. The man with the runic tattoo was unarmed. The only thing he carried was his regrets. The warrior, eyes full of burning fury, drew his sword. And not long after, a head hit the floor. Who are these two strange men? And what is the significance of this fatal meeting? In our own universe, these two may never meet again. But that doesn't mean there isn't a universe out there where they will. And it is that universe where today's tale springs from. The story between these two began a long, long time ago, when they were both set on a course of destruction. But to learn how these two finally met once again, we only need to go back a few days. While they seem more human than a lot of beings under the SCP Foundation's watchful eyes, there's no doubt that these two are anomalous. They're known as SCP-073 and SCP-076 but better known as Cain and Abel. From the name alone, most people with a basic knowledge of the Bible could tell that these two have a connection, but the particulars were largely a mystery to the Foundation. They wanted to know how much of the story was actually true. SCP researchers approached SCP-073, aka Cain, and asked if he'd be interested in reuniting with his brother one last time. It took Cain three days to answer, yes, but on one condition. 
that he was the only person who could abort the mission. The Foundation mulled over this requirement for three days before the O5 Council finally made a decision. Cross-testing approved. These two brothers, separated by millennia, would finally meet again, and the SCP Foundation would get to watch what happened when they did. Of course, for safety reasons, the cross-test would take place in 076's containment facility, a bedrock chamber 200 meters beneath the sea. That would be the closest thing to safe this fateful meeting could ever be. Though safe was really a relative term when it came to SCP-076. His escape attempts were as frequent and unpredictable as they were deadly, and everyone who'd ever worked with him knew exactly why. To the untrained eye, it would seem strange to create such a complex facility for a 3 meter squared stone cube, known as SCP-076-01. But the cube isn't what's being locked up here. The real danger comes from the corpse stored inside, known as SCP-076-02, but better known as Abel. He's a lean, olive-skinned man who appears to be in his late 20s. But his most distinct physical feature is the fact he's covered in an elaborate network of arcane and occult tattoos, largely of scowling demonic faces, similar to those found on members of the Yakuza. Whenever Abel's corpse reanimates, as it does at random intervals, everyone in his vicinity is in terrible danger. He's capable of pulling bladed weapons out of miniature dimensional rifts that appear around him, though he does this so quickly that it seems as though the weapons are simply materializing in his hands. Despite the increasingly complex efforts to contain him, Abel has been able to breach containment and go on brutal rampages multiple times, killing scores of Foundation personnel in the process. Abel possesses superhuman strength, speed, and durability. During prior containment breaches, he was able to shrug off rounds from 50 caliber machine guns. He's torn through reinforced steel doors. He's even swatted bullets from both handguns and assault rifles out of the air with a length of steel rebar. Only killing him can truly end one of these rampages, and the Foundation has had to go to terrifying lengths in order to achieve this during past containment breaches. He's been drowned, asphyxiated, crushed, burned to death with a thermite grenade directly inserted into his chest cavity, and even disintegrated by the activation of the facility's on-site nuclear warhead. This may seem like overkill, but if Abel were ever to make his way into a major population center, the fatalities would be… well, of biblical proportions. Even death can't keep him down for long. His body will rapidly decompose and reappear intact within SCP-076-01. There's no telling when he'll reawaken, and his periods of inactivity can range from hours to years. Because of this, he must be constantly observed by guards highly proficient in close combat and always ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with perhaps the most dangerous melee combatant in history. He's such a proficient killer that there was once a project aimed at weaponizing Abel, but this turned out to be a disastrous failure for the Foundation. When they ran out of missions to give him, Abel's thirst for blood caused him to turn his blade on his allies with no remorse, hacking them up with the same ruthless abandon he gave his assigned enemies. Interestingly, Abel does seem to have a twisted sense of honor. He has respect for combatants capable of providing him with a real challenge, and has even expressed concern for guards he considers to be respectable adversaries. But don't be fooled. There is no reasoning with Abel. Either you kill him, or he kills you. And trust us, he's much better at it than you are. While he's often overshadowed by world-ending anomalies or more talkative mass killers like SCP-682, Abel is one of the most deadly creatures known to the Foundation. Abel's counterpart, 073, is an entirely different story. Despite his namesake being the first biblical murderer, this Cain is a far more enigmatic figure. A tall man in his early 30s appearing to be of Middle Eastern descent, he has two very notable physical characteristics. The untranslated Sumerian symbol tattooed on his forehead, and the fact that several of his body parts, namely his arms, legs, spinal cord, and shoulder blades, have been replaced by mysterious prosthetics of unknown origin. Unlike Abel, Cain is polite, non-confrontational, articulate, and communicative. He's even allowed to wander the facility he's housed in freely, though with certain regulations. Namely, that Cain is never permitted to come into contact with plant life or uncovered ground. This is because, in spite of the fact Kane doesn't appear to harbor any malicious intent, direct contact with him causes plants to wither and die, and the ground 
to become infertile. If Cain was ever introduced into a natural environment again, he could unwittingly cause an ecological catastrophe with his mere presence. In that sense, he could almost be as dangerous to large populations as Abel. However, Cain's danger to flora is only one of his several anomalous qualities. Another is extraordinary mental capabilities and a near-perfect memory. His memory and ability to recall is so good that some Foundation personnel have suggested using Kane's mind as a kind of backup server for the Foundation's collective knowledge. But perhaps his most well-known anomalous trait is his ability to act as a kind of immortal human voodoo doll. That's right. Any damage inflicted on Kane causes no permanent injury to him and is reflected back on the perpetrator. While Kane has remarked on still being able to feel the pain of these assaults, He's functionally immortal. This damage-reflecting ability has even made performing certain kinds of tests impossible, as doctors attempting to draw blood from Kane have found that their sample was actually their own blood, and their skin exhibited the telltale bruising and puncture marks of blood testing. But of most interest to the Foundation right now was the fact that Kane has shown prior knowledge of Abel. However, he was cagey when questioned. He refused to add any additional information and commented that it would be best if he and Abel were never brought into contact. But what does never really mean when you live forever? Cain finally did agree to the test. And while nobody knew what caused Cain's change of heart, the Foundation knew better than to push him and potentially get the entire mission scrapped. Cain was taken from his facility and transported to the access point of Abel's underwater prison. The experiment's design was simple. Kane would occupy a temporary residence in Abel's containment facility until he next reanimated, at which point the interaction between them would be closely observed. Perhaps it would take weeks, months, or even years before Abel once again awoke and left his cube. But when he did, Kane would be there. Thankfully, as Kane whispered soothing words into Abel's tomb, the resurrection took only minutes. If you were expecting a heartwarming reunion, think again. Cain tried to apologize, but Abel immediately struck him with a decapitating blow, which, due to Cain's damage-reflecting properties, caused him to sever his own head instead. Cain remained at Abel's side as he regenerated, and as soon as Abel did, he immediately tried killing Cain again. It went on like this again and again and again. It was an arduous process, and eventually, even Abel began to tire of it. The duo fell into a tearful embrace. Abel asked his brother why he killed him so long ago, and Cain apologized, saying it was the actions of a younger and more foolish man. In that moment, the two finally reconciled, and having fulfilled their bargain with their creator, both finally crumbled into dust. Peace at last. As we said, this didn't happen to the Cain and Abel of our universe, but when universes are more numerous than grains of sand in an endless desert, such a thing has indeed happened somewhere out there, perhaps in a kinder universe than our own. We can only hope that Cain and Abel may someday get to meet and find the same resolution. But until then, these brothers will remain one of the most dangerous and fascinating duos in the Foundation's catalog. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. It's an iconic line from It's a Wonderful Life, and even if you don't believe in angels, it is a pleasant image. After all, angels are the embodiment of goodness and light. So an angel getting its wings has to be a good thing, right? Well, as anyone who's ever eaten one too many Christmas cookies can tell you, it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Even something that sounds like the embodiment of all things good in theory can become deadly when taken to the extreme. That is where SCP-469, also known as the Many-Winged Angel, comes in. This angel-like creature is anything but innocent, and in fact it has been responsible for multiple deaths of SCP Foundation personnel during its captivity. SCP-469 may be deadly, but it is also undeniably beautiful in a mysterious, ethereal way. When first seen, it appears to be nothing more than a massive pile of pristine white feathers, like something out of a pillow commercial. The pile measures 24 feet in diameter and weighs at least 2 tons. However, like many of the entities contained within the walls of the Foundation's countless containment sites, all is not as it seems with 469. What looks at first glance to be a pile of feathers is in fact a dense, curled mass of giant wings. 
The wings vary in size from the tiny wingspan of a sparrow to the staggering 3.6 meter wingspan of the wandering albatross. The one thing they have in common is their plumage, with each wing being covered with the same glossy white feathers. The Foundation was able to perform a series of x-rays on the massive wings, revealing a skeletal structure beneath the feathers. Like those of a bird, the wings' bones are hollow. However, they are unnaturally soft and flexible, allowing for a range of motion that no known bird possesses. This accounts for the curvature of the wings and their ability to coil tightly into each other. The X-ray also provided the first and only recorded glimpse at the creature hiding underneath all the feathers. At the center of the layers upon layers of wings is a humanoid creature curled into a fetal position. In defiance of the laws of natural anatomy, every single wing appears to be fused to this creature's spine. How would it be able to move under the weight of these wings, or even if it could, is as of yet unknown. The first Foundation personnel lost to SCP-469 were D-Class personnel D-112 and D-624, who were sent in to investigate the nature of the creature and attempt to contact the humanoid entity identified on the X-rays. 112 and 624 entered the room, equipped with gloves and protective eye gear, as scientists watched the situation unfold on a monitor on a video feed. No one expected much to come of the encounter. The working hypothesis was the layers of feathers would simply be too thick to get through without seriously damaging the bones. It would be a fairly uneventful experiment, or so they thought. 112 approached SCP-469 first, and attempted to part a section of its feathers with his hands as 624 stood back and observed. The moment his fingertips touched the feathers, a rustling sound filled the room. The feathers began to quiver, shaking as if all waking up at once from a deep slumber. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the hundreds and hundreds of wings unfurled and pulled 112 into their depths. He was swept into a swirl of feathers and, within seconds, he had disappeared from view completely. Though 624 and the scientists watching on their monitor could no longer see him, they could certainly hear him. From the moment the wings pulled him into the sea of feathers, 112 had begun to scream in agony. His screams persisted, growing louder and more desperate even as the voice cracked and grew weak. 624 stood, frozen in place with fear and shock. 624 was ordered to attempt to retrieve 112 from the feathers, but made no move to do so. He simply stared at the feathers, eyes wide, face pale, as the pain shrieks of his colleague bounced off the sterile white walls of the containment room. A guard called over the intercom, threatening to terminate 624 if he did not attempt to remove 112 from SCP-469's grasp. This warning seemed to shock 624 back into action, and he made a run for the center feathers, arms up to protect his face. Again the sound of rustling as the feathers began to quake. The wings unfurled once more, and 624 did not even have a chance to turn back before he was pulled in to meet the same dismal fate as the other D-Class. His screams of pain joined 112 as the scientists watching over the monitor could do nothing to help them. As the two men cried out in pain and horror from within their winged prison, something began to happen that the scientists had never seen before. The feathers started to shake again, faster than before, and at first the wings appeared to be unfolding again. Upon second look, though, it was clear they hadn't moved. There were simply more of them now. As the men continued to scream, more feathers appeared, the wings stretching out and elongating as new wings sprouted as if from nowhere. SCP-469 appeared to be feeding on the sound of their screams and using that energy to expand. It was only after several long minutes when the screaming finally stopped that the growth of the wings did too. At this point, the wings shifted again, expelling the bodies of 112 and 624 from within its folds, dropping them limply on the ground. Though their deaths were unfortunate, the loss of 112 and 624 did reveal some new information about SCP-469. First, that it could grow, and apparently needed to feed on sounds in order to do so. Second, that it was deadly to humans, and most likely to other living things as well. Autopsies of 112 and 624's corpses would later reveal exactly what happened to them, and how SCP-469 kills its prey. Though 469's feathers may look as though they would be soft to the touch, each feather is actually made up of sharp barbs that are capable of piercing clothing and skin. 
These barbs release a neurotoxin into the system that activates every pain receptor in the body of the victim. The neurotoxin present in these feathers has not been identified anywhere else in nature, but is somewhat similar in structure and function to the neurotoxins excreted by the cone snail and in the bite of the blue-ringed octopus. In addition to the pain-inducing neurotoxin, the feathers also carry several unidentified stimulant compounds, where the neurotoxin on its own would induce enough pain for the affected party to pass out almost immediately. The stimulants serve to keep the victim conscious. SCP Foundation scientists posit that this is so that 469 can get as much noise, in this case in the form of screams, out of its pain as possible, and achieve maximum growth before the captive creature dies or goes into shock. Further experiments confirm this theory and show that SCP-469 will react similarly when exposed to any living creature capable of making a sound and experiencing pain, not just humans. Non-living matter, though, including dead animals, elicit no response from 469. Additional experiments were then undertaken that involved applying various different sounds in order to test their effect on SCP-469's growth. Though it feeds on any sounds produced in its presence, it seems to respond most strongly to musical sounds, exhibiting a particularly strong response to classical music. No sound elicits a stronger reaction from this creature, however, than the sound of ringing bells. It is rumored that when a bell was rung in the presence of 469, the humanoid at the center of the feathers is said to have moved for the first time on record. Apparently whatever is at the center appeared to wake up and unfurl its wings, revealing itself. But unfortunately, all security footage of this incident has been wiped, and the data has been expunged from the record leaving the creature's true form a mystery. You may be remembering that four members of Foundation personnel on record were lost to SCP-469, and that only two have been mentioned so far. The second pair of casualties resulted when the Foundation attempted to terminate SCP-469, believing that there was no more scientific benefit to keeping it alive, or at least that the possible benefits did not outweigh the risks. It was ordered that SCP-469 be terminated by any means necessary. Two skilled personnel, Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith, were sent into the containment facility in hazmat gear, armed with several sharp instruments. They were to attempt to use these to cut through the forest of feathers and soft bones until they could reach the humanoid at the center. It was presumed that once they did, and the creature no longer had the protection of its poisonous feathers, that it would be relatively easy to kill. They could not have been more wrong. Dr. Jones approached the dense cover of feathers with a pair of sharpened gardening shears, while Dr. Smith opted for a machete. At first, the strategy appeared to be working. Dr. Jones made several quick cuts, with feathers fluttering to the floor and sticking to the hazmat suit as Dr. Smith slashed into the feathers with his machete, making similarly promising progress. However, the situation quickly took a turn for the worse when Dr. Jones dropped her shears and let out a blood-curdling scream. The feathers had taken a little longer to get through the suit to her skin, but somehow they managed to find a way just the same. Smith grabbed Jones and attempted to make a break for it, but he was too slow and far too close to the feathers already. The wings wrapped around them and swallowed them both up, leaving the researchers outside helpless to do anything but listen to their screams and wait for them to go quiet. After several minutes, they finally did, and now larger SCP-469 had officially claimed another two Foundation personnel. Obviously, 469 could not be terminated using any methods that would place the responsible personnel within its grasp. That was simply too risky. So, the Foundation selected a team of D-Class personnel to attempt to burn the feathers with an array of flamethrowers. Though the feathers were vulnerable to fire and began to blacken and disintegrate on contact, the sound of the flames being expelled was loud enough to feed SCP-469. Its growth was so quick in response to the noise that the fire could not keep up with the amount of new feathers and wings being produced. By the same time the flamethrowers ran out of propellant, 469 was the same size it had been when they started. Other terminations have been discussed, including the possibility of submerging the entire creature in a highly corrosive acid, but so far this has not yet been attempted. Whatever they end up trying, it is clear that nothing that produces a significant amount of noise will be able to kill 469. So where is it now? 
What's become of this perverse angel with the never-ending wings? Currently, it is kept in an airtight, soundproof chamber where nothing can trigger the growth of any more wings. So, what is it? An angel? A demon? A twisted, mutated bird of some kind? It is entirely possible that we will never know. But It's a Wonderful Life had something right, even by accident. Every time a bell rings, something, twisted and deadly though it may be, gets its wings. Man, it's even better on the 15th read. Oh, hello, I didn't see you there, dear viewers of SCP Explained. I'm on break between supervising SCP-682 termination attempts and inspecting the mops we use on SCP-173's leavings, so I decided to do what all the cool people are doing in their spare time right now. Rereading Chainsaw Man, the hit manga by Japanese author and artist Tatsuki Fujimoto. For the uninitiated, it's the story of Denji, a poor young man from Japan who makes his living hunting devils, dangerous creatures that are embodiments of mankind's greatest fears. But when that living leads to him dying at the hands of a gang of zombie Yakuza, believe me, it makes sense in context, he bonds with the legendary Chainsaw Devil and is reborn as Chainsaw Man, an unconventional superhero who chainsaws first and asks questions later. Naturally, I was eager to see how one of our own bloodthirsty killers would fare against Denji's Chainsaws of Fury, so I selected the most violent, battle-hardened, and carnage-hungry anomaly out there, SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel. The two of them have a surprising amount of things in common. Both are effectively immortal and can revive after sustaining massive physical injuries. Both absolutely love to fight with their array of deadly weapons and anomalous strength. Both have been part of experimental operations groups, with Denji being a member of Japan's Public Safety Devil Hunters Division 4, and Abel being an ex-member of the SCP Foundation's disastrous Pandora's Box Mobile Task Force most of which he later massacred out of boredom. You can probably see why these two really did feel like the perfect matchup. So after forcing the trusty Anomatron 6000 to read every currently available volume of Chainsaw Man and compute years of Abel's gruesome battle data, I've set up the perfect simulation for your viewing pleasure. And hey, fellow fans of the manga, isn't it horrifying that even we beat MAPPA to the punch of animating this thing? <laughs> ah, god, that joke will age poorly if that anime comes out before this. Anyway, let's crank this machine into action and let her rip. Japan, 1997. Everything is roasting in the July heat. Men in Black, Harrison Ford's Air Force One, and Airbud are hitting theaters for the first time. Everything is right with the world. That's why over in the headquarters of the Public Safety Devil Hunting Department, Denji, our chainsaw-loving hero, is being praised by his kind boss and mentor figure, Makima, a lovable, supportive woman who will never do anything wrong. She even loves dogs. How could a person who loves dogs ever be evil? That very morning, Denji and his Chainsaw Man form managed to defeat the accidentally making a mistake on your tax forms and now you're going to prison devil, who had been terrorizing downtown Tokyo. It was a challenging battle, but in the end, he'd managed to turn the tables and defeat the creature by setting it on fire. Needless to say, Makima was extremely pleased with Denji's work here, but now she had considerably more graver news to impart. She'd gotten word from an envoy of another organization that hunts down dangerous and anomalous creatures, the SCP Foundation, that an extremely lethal entity had breached their containment and was now somewhere in Japan. The entity in question was not a devil and thereby would be working on a different rule set. Makima opened a file faxed to her by the Foundation. Yes, remember, this is set in 1997 and gave Denji the crucial lowdown. Several hours ago, the entity known as Abel had resurrected from his huge black sarcophagus in the underwater chamber of the classified facility Containment Area 25B. After waking up, Abel had slaughtered his way through the entire base, killing every SCP Foundation operative in his path and then swimming out into the Pacific Ocean. Sometime after that, he infiltrated a Japanese cargo ship and murdered all the workers on board before steering the ship back towards the land of the rising sun, where he hoped to claim even more victims. Makima told Denji that it would fall to him and his associates to stop this Abel, with a little help from the SCP Foundation's intelligence. But be warned, 
Abel is an incredible combatant with extreme physical strength and durability, as well as surprising tactical intelligence. It wouldn't be an easy fight, but Makima promised that if Denji won, she'd hug him and go to a nearby karaoke bar with him. Denji replied, Consider him dead already, Miss Makima. Meanwhile, Abel was walking through the slums of Tokyo, marveling at the neon signs for bars and clubs. His journey to Japan hadn't been an accident. Abel had been to Japan once before, in the year 1605. He'd faced the legendary Japanese philosopher and swordsman Miyato Musashi, considered by many to be one of the greatest warriors in human history. Abel had dueled Musashi, who famously wielded two katanas at once, in the hills of the Harima province where, after a tense battle, Musashi cut him down. Abel would not resurrect again during Musashi's lifetime, but the battle gave him a deep and abiding respect for the legendary warrior. Abel knew that if the opportunity ever rose again, he would return to Japan in hopes of experiencing such a brilliant battle yet again. But the industrial and technological boom had changed so much. It was no longer the quiet and pastoral Japan he'd experienced, but a booming epicenter of trade and commerce. He found it all strange and perplexing. Suddenly, he found himself surrounded by a group of Japanese street thugs, many of them wielding switchblades. They laughed at his strange outfit, which to them looked like an old, worn bedsheet. One of the smarter members of the group had already decided to go home when the others made up their mind to mug Abel. The warrior's extensive tattoos made him look like a Middle Eastern Yakuza Don. The rest, however, were happy to take their chances with him. Empty your pockets if that goofy toga even has pockets, the leader said, holding up his switchblade. Unless you want to get cut. Abel just smirked and drew a pair of long, obsidian daggers. In the following moment, the alley was filled with screams, then was silent yet again. Abel walked on, breathing a sigh of disappointment at how incredibly mediocre this first fight had been, his blades dripping with fresh blood. Musashi is rolling in his grave, Abel thought to himself. Meanwhile, across town, Denji and the rest of Division 4 were mobilizing. It was him, the serious sword-wielding Aki, and the adorable, pathologically lying, blood fiend, Power. They'd been told over the phone by a man named Dr. Bright that Abel would be relatively easy to track down. He's not known for his subtlety. All you need to do is follow the trail of carnage he causes wherever he goes. From the way he talks about him, it seems almost as though Dr. Bright bears a personal grudge against Abel. How strange. Power didn't seem intimidated. She proudly proclaimed, I don't think this battle will be difficult at all. In fact, I've faced this Abel before and defeated him handily. Aki sighed and asked, When did this happen? Last Tuesday, of course. She replied. Power had only heard about Abel this morning. But Denji and Aki had learned better than to dispute her at this point. Suddenly, a large television screen that had been previously relaying an ad for a cutting-edge stereo system cut to an emergency news report. There had been a horrific incident in downtown Tokyo, where a bar had been attacked and most of its patrons murdered by a deranged, tattooed man carrying a pair of huge swords. Aki immediately recognized this place. The bar was Yakuza-owned. If this Abel was on the hunt for worthy opponents, it makes all the sense in the world that Japan's iconic crime syndicates would be his first target. Denji, Aki, and Power knew exactly where they needed to go. Over at the bar, Abel was having a whale of a time. Innocent patrons were running and screaming, while the Yakuza engaged in an all-out war with a terrifying inhuman warrior. Several of them had already been cut down. Two Yakuza soldiers behind the bar were reloading illegal Uzis and preparing to return fire. Both were sweating, terrified by the sudden, random attack. When they'd shot him before, he'd managed to dodge most of the bullets and expertly blocked the rest with his swords. Who the hell had sent this monster? Was he with the Triads, the Russian mob, or some devil summoned by the Japanese government to crack down on them? Whatever the case, he seemed almost impossible to kill. The two men stood back up and opened fire. Abel held his two swords and spun like a propeller, blocking all the bullets almost effortlessly. He then produced another dagger, seemingly from thin air, and threw it directly into the heart of one of the two remaining Yakuza behind the bar. He dropped to the ground dead instantly, 
leaving only his friend alive in a bar full of corpses. That's when Abel noticed a decorative katana behind the bar. He smiled and ordered the surviving Yakuza soldier to pick up the sword and give him a real fight. The hapless mobster realized in that moment that this guy was truly crazy, whoever he was. But what choice did he have now? With terror in his heart, the last surviving Yakuza grabbed the katana and unsheathed it. Good. Abel said, his voice deep and menacing. Now, come fight me. Let's see if you last a few seconds longer than your worthless friends, shall we? He did not. The second the Yakuza ran towards Abel, and the ancient swordsman swiped at him with one of his blades, cutting through the katana and the opponent holding it. A puny gangster never stood a chance against a deadly immortal warrior, and Abel was furious. The last time he was here, he faced a truly expert killer, who even managed to end Abel's life in a single combat. And now he was slaying insects in a karaoke bar. Pathetic. Suddenly, his ears pricked up. He turned to see a red axe flying at his head at incredible speeds. With his superhuman reflexes, he managed to dodge just in time, but the axe still cleaved off a chunk of his hair as it passed. Abel could see the one who threw it standing at the entrance to the bar. It was the blood fiend, Power, who'd made the axe out of her own blood. Standing next to her were Denji and Aki, Denji wielding an axe and Aki stoically observing. Damn, Miss Makima promised we'd do karaoke at this bar if I beat you, Denji said. You're going down for this. Abel smiled and pulled out another pair of blades. Finally, he roared. Warriors who fight the old-fashioned way. I feared the years had stolen you all from me. Power stepped forward, producing another blood axe from nowhere. She yelled, Tremble in fear, Abel. Tis I, your arch nemesis, the mighty power! Abel had literally never seen her before in his thousands of years of life but he appreciated that these warriors were at least able to match his level of drama. As far as he was concerned, the fight was on, but even Abel didn't know the level of fighting he was getting in for here. As he charged forward, the trio split, immediately surrounding him. Good tactics, Abel thought to himself. Already, this was promising. Aki, who had remained quiet up to this point, attacked first. He drew a Titano knife from his suit jacket and slashed at Abel with impressive speed, but unlike three of the other combatants in this situation, Aki was only human, which gave him a serious disadvantage. Abel decided it would be best to put him out of commission first. With a quick and brutal kick to the chest, Aki was thrown against the wall with the majority of his ribs broken. Revved up by his own bloodlust, Abel turned to Denji in power and grinned like a maniac. This was already the most fun he'd had in a long time. Who are these people? Doesn't matter, he thought. They'll be dead soon anyway. While Abel was still locked in thought, Power pulled out a comically large hammer made out of her own blood and brought it down towards Abel. He was surprised by the sudden attack. Did this girl have the same weapon-producing powers as him? This just keeps getting more interesting. Tis the end, Abel! Power screamed as the hammer came down. You have once again been defeated by the mighty Power! Again, just to clarify, these two had never met each other. But it was already too late. Abel punched upwards his clenched fist colliding with the hammer. He hit it with such terrifying force that Power's blood hammer shattered against his knuckles. In that same instant, Abel noticed Denji running at him with an axe from behind. Abel produced another obsidian dagger and threw it into Denji's forehead, dropping him to the ground immediately. Pathetic. Power tried to produce another weapon, but she used up too much blood already. Before she had a chance to make anything substantial, Abel sprung forwards with terrifying speed trying to land a killing blow. But even weakened, Power was freakishly fast. She was able to dodge his blow and kick him in the ribs, momentarily stunning him. Of course, she took the time to gloat, putting her hands on her hips and laughing victoriously. Need a second to catch your breath, Abel. It is to be expected. None can keep up with me. She grandiosely announced. Perhaps you should just give up and agree to become my servant. I might even teach you a thing or two about fighting. Suddenly, Abel was standing right in front of her, squeezing her throat with his iron grip. He smiled, flashing teeth, and said, If you want to kill, kill. Don't talk. With a surprisingly minimal amount of strength, he squeezed and heard a crunch from Power's neck. 
he dropped her limp body to the ground. Lucky for Power, Abel wasn't aware that a fiend like Power can survive an injury like this as long as she's fed some more blood. Instead, he just sighed in disappointment. Is that all you weaklings have to offer? He bellowed. Aki, barely conscious after being kicked against the wall, remained just conscious enough to activate his contract with a powerful beast known as the Fox Devil. He twists his hands into a strange gesture and whispers the word, Come, before falling unconscious. But that's still enough. Suddenly, a gigantic demonic fox claw bursts through the wall of the bar, spraying dust and rubble everywhere. Abel was definitely not expecting that. He dodged several times as the claw swiped for him, often barely missing him. For its last strike, it lunged forward and raked four claw marks across his chest. Abel was shocked by the sudden pain. It felt fantastic. He pulled a long obsidian spear out of one of his pocket dimensions and forced it down through the fox devil's paw and into the ground, pinning it in place. After a moment of thrashing, the claw dissipated into smoke, lending Abel another victory, though even he would admit this was a more exciting fight than the other ones had been. Was that it? Had he gained total victory once more just like he so often did these days? He was about to take pity on himself when Denji rose up behind him. How about a rematch? Denji asked. Abel grinned. He liked this kid. Challenge me, child, Abel said. Well, since you asked, Denji smirked. Denji reached into his shirt and grabbed the ripcord emerging from his chest. It was time to go into overdrive on this thing. He gave it a mighty yank, and like the rev of a chainsaw, the madness began. Denji transformed, giant blades emerging from his arms, and his head transformed into a toothy saw blade nightmare. He gave a mechanical roar that spewed smoke. This wasn't just Denji anymore. This was Chainsaw Man. Now this, Abel thought, feeling his adrenaline spike, is more like it. Following Denji's lead, Abel reached into one of his pocket dimensions and pulled out one of his favorite weapons, one he'd only previously used against the mighty hard-to-destroy reptile SCP-682, the Chainsaw Claymore. A huge two-handed sword with the eternally twisting, shredding teeth of a chainsaw ever circulating around it. It was time for Chainsaw vs. Chainsaw. What the hell are you waiting for? Chainsaw Man roared. Are we gonna stand around all day or are we gonna fight? Abel couldn't have said it better himself. The two charged at one another at lightning speeds, chainsaw clashing against chain sword. The sheer force of the contact was enough to send a shockwave blasting through the bar. It rapidly became a power struggle, each of them trying hard to force their chainsaws out of the stalemate. Realizing that this time he perhaps couldn't win with raw strength, Abel back flipped away to reassess his options. But Chainsaw Man had no intention of giving Abel time to think about it. He darted towards Abel with the weight and momentum of a runaway freight train. If Abel hadn't raised his claymore to parry, he would have been shredded to pieces by the devil's saws in an instant. Instead, the two of them rocketed out of the nearby wall in a cascade of debris, causing everyone on the outside street to run for their lives. The two quickly stood from the stumble. The two quickly stood up, catching their breath. Impressive, Abel said. You're much better than the others. Instead of replying, Denji briefly retracted his arm chainsaws and grabbed a nearby parked car, throwing it directly at Abel. Abel reacted quickly, cleaving the car in half with his claymore and charging for Chainsaw Man again. Just before Abel could land a lethal strike, Chainsaw Man deployed his chainsaws again, blocking the blow. Abel sped around him trying to strike again and again, but Chainsaw Man blocked every strike with stunning efficacy. Abel was astonished. Few had ever been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him like this before. He could feel his heart pounding gloriously in his chest. He would give Denji a warrior's death. With a furious yell, Abel brought down the Chainsaw Claymore for a devastating vertical strike, but Chainsaw Man was ready. He arranged his arm chainsaws in a cross formation like a giant pair of scissors and caught Abel's chain sword between them. Chainsaw Man pulled his arms in opposite directions, slicing Abel's mighty sword in half. The immortal swordsman skidded backwards to avoid the fallout, producing two smaller blades immediately. This Chainsaw Man just kept exceeding expectations, didn't he? Abel would need to change tactics if he wanted to win this one. Chainsaw Man was impressed by the speed and tenacity of his foe. 
For someone who apparently wasn't even a devil, Abel sure packed a hell of a punch. Did he ever run out of those damned weapons? As though attempting to answer Chainsaw Man's question for him, Abel began running around his flank, rapidly producing and throwing blades and axes in a startling volley. Chainsaw Man was able to use his chainsaw arms and face to block most of them, but not all of them. Several daggers and small throwing axes splattered into the tender flesh of Chainsaw Man's chest. Abel had successfully wounded him, and he wasn't done. Feeling a little more confident now, Abel decided to take a different tactic. He produced a large spiked mace from thin air and ran at Chainsaw Man while the devil was still recovering from his projectile attack. With one brutal whack, he sent Denji flying down the street, carving a rut into the concrete beneath him. But Abel wasn't done. While Chainsaw Man was still trying to recover, Abel leaped onto him and began beating him into the ground with his mace. The strikes were so brutal, they shook the earth and sent cracks across the surrounding ground. Then, Abel stopped. He realized, for a moment, that he was letting his bloodlust get the better of him. This was dishonorable. Where would be the fun in beating this boy to death while he lay on the ground and depriving himself of one of the greatest opponents he's had in quite some time? No, that would not do at all. He'd give him one more chance. On your feet, boy, Abel said. You fight well. Get up and carry on. I won't let a beast as rare as you die like a common dog. Rise and fight me. And Chainsaw Man did as he was told. Abel was shocked to see the very ground shatter underneath him as Chainsaw Man burst up through it, all his swords at the ready. The mace was thrown from Abel's hands as Chainsaw Man launched up towards him, all metal teeth and fury. Luckily for Abel, he pulled out a battle axe just in time to block the flurry of brutal strikes from the patron saint of chainsaws. Now this was a fight even Musashi would be proud of. Yes, boy, yes, Abel yelled. This is true combat. Chainsaw Man replied with the swing of his blades, which Abel was nearly able to dodge. The two finally landed back down on the ground, and Abel was fast enough to bury his battle axe in Chainsaw Man's shoulder. Before the devil could return a blow to Abel, the anomalous swordsman pulled out a pair of his favorite swords and locked Chainsaw Man's arms in place. Chainsaw Man was undeniably incredibly powerful, but it looked like Abel's superior experience and tactics might save him this time. What the hell are you? Chainsaw Man roared. You've been a worthy opponent, boy. Those are few and far between, Abel said. I'll remember you for this. But before Abel could execute a killing blow, he felt a blood-red throwing axe stick into his back. Abel winced in pain to see Power and Aki about 30 feet behind him. Power was propping Aki up. He donated some of his blood to bring her back to life, and she was just as delusionally cocky as ever. Abel was about to say something, but he already made a fatal mistake, letting his guard down. Before another word could pass the cursed warrior's lips, one of Chainsaw Man's armed chainsaws passed directly through his heart, tearing it apart with Abel's chest. It was a sudden and decisive killing blow. Chainsaw Man pulled his saw back out of Abel's chest, stained with the deadly anomaly's blood. Abel collapsed to the ground, wheezing and bleeding profusely from the hole in his chest. But strangely, as Power, Aki, and Chainsaw Man converged around him, they realized he was smiling. Thank you, Abel said, and died yet again. With the battle won, like an incredible hulk made of metal, Chainsaw Man transformed back into Denji. The trio stood around Abel's corpse, deeply confused as to what had just happened. If this was the kind of thing the SCP Foundation normally dealt with, they all silently agreed that perhaps it would be better not to get involved with them in the future. Except Power, of course, who said, You two should be thanking me for defeating him. You both owe me drinks for this. Hundreds of miles away in a black sarcophagus deep underwater, surrounded by professional SCP Foundation divers, Abel's body once again returned. Who knows how long he'd remain sleeping in there. But what we do know is that his deathless sleep was suffused with the sweet dreams, knowing that this world still held worthy opponents. And for Abel, that was everything. We'd been so cautious, keeping quiet, only moving at night. But sometimes, despite all your best efforts, you just get unlucky. We made our way through what we thought was an abandoned street, littered with broken down cars when those things had slithered out and ambushed us. Kaspar, who was always the most trigger happy of us, panicked and opened fire with his scavenged submachine gun on the largest of the creatures. Big mistake. 
It didn't slow the monster down, and only seemed to attract more. It'd be Blob City before sunrise now, but poor Kaspar wouldn't make it that long. Fleshy tendrils wrapped around his limbs and pulled him into the terrible mass of one of the creatures. It started reshaping around him, enveloping him as he screamed until the tide of flesh coursing down his throat silenced him. The whole time, the monster just kept gibbering madness in a warped voice. Become one, yes. Let our cells bond and our minds coagulate in the glorious shimmering light. We will all be one in daylight, pretty flower. Yes, yes, yes. And then there were four. Me, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. There had been more of us once, but in this war of attrition, we always seemed to be the ones who had to lose. And if we didn't get away from these monsters quickly, then there wouldn't be any of us left soon enough. We ran, ducking and weaving around the cars as the blobs got closer. There were so many of them all howling and ranting, zealots for the only cause their melted excuses for minds could understand anymore. Occasionally, we fired back, hoping to slow them down a little, but it never worked. The guns, if anything, were a psychological support mechanism, and something to scare off other survivors who were even more desperate than us. When it came to the blobs, especially the big ones, the only things you could do were run and hope, and hope's in short supply these days. No matter how fast we ran, the blobs kept catching up, and they didn't seem to get tired. Knowing we couldn't outrun them, we ran up to one of the abandoned cars and crouched behind them, breathing raggedly. This whole stupid mission, in hopes of eventually reaching safety, a good night's sleep behind solid walls and some people who actually know what the hell is going on. I drew my sidearm out of my pocket. Even if I didn't make it out of here, I wouldn't turn into one of those monsters. Pulling back the hammer, I muttered a quiet prayer. But there's a god out there, he had a hell of a lot to answer for right now. I looked to Ellen, Darcy, and Jones, and they all had the same idea. It was a pleasure to know them all, after everything that had happened. We heard the blobs getting closer, their lunatic whispers growing in volume and intensity, as they always did before they claimed one of us. I breathed in a sigh, ready to accept my fate, knowing what I needed to do. It all seemed to be over, until he appeared. I looked up and spotted a strange man approaching. He was dressed in an old-fashioned hessian toga, his hair and beard frosty white. I couldn't identify his age or race, but those factors seemed secondary to the fact his eyes were glowing brilliant white, as if exuding pure energy. He raised a hand, the same glowing aura of pure white energy emanating off of it. I'd seen so many things that terrified me in the past six months, but this, this was the first time I'd experienced something I could call awe. He walked towards us with a stillness and confidence and said, You look like you could use a hand. Where were you when day broke? Whoever's left, they remember. I was in a supermarket with my wife and two kids. Just another normal day. I was worrying about bills, taxes, and whatever we were going to have for dinner that night. If the devil exists, I'd sell my soul to that nasty red creep to get those worries back. Lucky for us, we were in the back half of the store, lit entirely by artificial light. The people checking out their groceries down front, right in the front of the building's huge glass facade, they were the first to go down. All these terrible, drowned screams. First, the exact kind of shrieks you'd expect from somebody starting to melt, then the gurgling, like a backed up drain as their mouth and throat melted around the sound, choking it. Those were the first few minutes of hell on earth. I've never been the smartest man. I was a roofer, back when things made sense. Never went to college, never been much for reading. But I had intuition, and I credit that with surviving this long. My dad was in the service. Two tours in Nam. He always told me when I was a kid, the guys who didn't make it back, they panicked. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. They hope when everything hits the fan, you'll break formation, forget the plan, and all start scurrying in different directions like rats, just hoping you'll be the one who finds a crack and gets out. That's when they get you. When you panic, you're giving up the birthright of reason from letting the animal take over. An animal, son, are easier to kill. When the sun went bad that day, plenty of people in that store started running. They didn't know what they were running from or where they were running to. They just wanted to put some distance between themselves and the screaming. Every man for himself. I'd love to tell you all those people are dead now, but in actuality, they were in for a far worse fate. They ran out of the safety and cover of the store, putting themselves at the mercy of the light. 
Even as they melted, they kept running. They were blobs, slithering away, not even knowing that the thing they were running from had already gotten them. It all happened so fast, but I can remember every single detail. You can judge me if you like, I don't care anymore. If I could have spoken reason to those terrified people that day, hand on my heart, I would have. But one of man's greatest design flaws is that God made fear the master of reason. Nothing I could have said that day would have changed anything. The only ones I could hope to save were my family, so that's exactly what I did. We grabbed what we could, stayed away from windows, made our way to the nearest supply closet. We were in there for hours, we didn't come out until things were actually quiet, which coincidentally happened to be night. When we stepped outside the store, we saw the carnage that must have unfolded over the past few hours. Windows smashed, cars driven into storefronts and abandoned, slithering blobs of former people on the ground. In the space of a few hours, the world had truly and irrevocably changed. No matter what happened, even if we survived, we knew there would never be a normal as we'd know it before ever again. The same message was playing on every TV, radio, and computer. A logo I didn't quite recognize, along with an overlay that read, An important message from the SCP Foundation. It explained in an eternally looping robotic voice that they were superseding the control of all world governments to protect humanity from this new and terrifying threat. In short, the sun had turned against us. In some scenarios, survival is a curse. In those early days and weeks, you wouldn't believe the number of times I started to envy the dead. People who'd been wiped off the mortal coil by disease and car crashes and random acts of violence in the days before day broke. They had no idea how good they had it. Little by little, in this terrible new world, death became a kind of luxury. Because melting under the fiery gaze of the sun, that wasn't death, not even close. They seemed harmless at first, tragic, pitiful really. The voices on the TV even told us that to avoid starvation we could eat small parts of the melted, but over time, the situation evolved. I don't know when it started or why, but the blobs that had once been people started coagulating. They joined up, started turning into bigger creatures, all with one mind, always screaming and talking madness in a collage of stolen voices. These monsters existed for one purpose, and one purpose only, finding the people who were still normal and dragging them out into the light to join them. They roamed the world during the night, hunting, seeking, and given night was the only time we could ever safely move, this created problems for all of us. We lost so many to those terrible monsters, including my wife and both my kids. See what I mean about survival sometimes being a curse? Especially when you've got people to miss. I wish they were dead, all three of them, but I still hear them. Their voices added to the chorus of a house-sized flesh monster. But I lived on, if you can call this living. I met with others, like Kaspar, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. All of them had lost people. You hadn't lived this long if you hadn't lost people. We did all we could to keep surviving against the odds. We spent our days in basements and abandoned stores, and our nights dodging the flesh creatures and foraging for food. We eked out each day, taking every breath as it came. We didn't help for anything. Until one day we heard that the people at the SCP Foundation might know how to reverse all this. They needed all the people and help they could get at one of their bases, around 20 miles from us. It'd only be a couple nights walk to get there, we figured, so why not help out the cause? Safety in numbers, after all. And, truth be told, we miss people. After days of hiding and nights of traveling, we were ambushed, but you already know about that part. We lost Kaspar to one of those monsters and got cornered behind an abandoned car. However, as the blobs got closer and closer, that mysterious stranger with the glowing eyes appeared. He didn't walk like the rest of us. He was bold, confident, his back straight as a dancer's, like he feared nothing, like nothing here could hurt him. Suddenly, I felt a rumbling behind me. The car was rattling. I feared for a second that the blobs were crawling over it to get us, but when I turned, I saw the opposite was happening. The car was rising off of the ground, free-floating. Myself and the other survivors stared in astonishment as the stranger simply flicked his wrist. The floating car was thrown with tremendous force at the largest of the advancing blobs. It hit the beast so hard that the top of it simply splattered off, freezing what was left in place. Even the other blobs paused, seemingly astonished. We all turned to the stranger, still standing firm. Stand behind me if you wish to live, he said. There was something both passionate and commanding about his voice. It was impossible to hear him and not heed his words. All of us stood up and ran behind the stranger. 
as he lifted both hands. Debris climbed into the air. Cars, rocks, broken glass. The blobs were beginning to coagulate again, but this time, the stranger wasn't going to let them get the upper hand again. With a slight nod, everything he'd raised flew at the blobs with the force of a machine gun. They were decimated. The bigger ones cut apart, the smaller one fleeing to avoid the onslaught. After months of running from these monsters, I don't think any sight could have been more satisfying. When the creatures were gone, the stranger just gave a quiet sigh. He turned to us and asked if we were okay. The answer was, essentially, about as much as we can be. He told us that we'd be safe as long as we stuck with him. And after that display, we had every reason. We had every reason to believe him. We followed the stranger down the long, dark road. He always walked in the middle, fearless, making no attempt to hide. When we asked him his name, he told us that he goes by many names, but for the sake of simplicity, we could call him Matthew. We thanked Matthew for saving us, and he gave a sad sort of smile and told us that he only wished he could have done more. There was something so strange about Matthew, even beyond the fact he apparently had superpowers. I'd never met the man before, and I'd be willing to bet my right hand on that, and yet it felt like I'd known him my entire life. He was so different, and yet so incredibly familiar. We told them we were on our way to a nearby SCP Foundation facility, where we were told we'd find safe haven. We asked him if he knew where to find it. Matthew told us that, in fact, he'd lived there in that very site for decades. A visitor, just dropping in. He'd had a very stressful job before, and felt like taking a sabbatical while things ran themselves for once. Evidently, my help was more necessary than I imagined, he said. Occasionally, as we walked, we'd see blobs watching us from crevices and dark alleys on the side of the road. They seemed to watch, but for some reason, didn't approach. It was the most remarkable thing. Don't worry, he told us. I'm putting up invisible shields. None of them can approach us as long as I maintain my focus. Of course, we'd all heard stories of remarkable and terrifying things wandering the wasteland we used to call planet Earth. You couldn't run into other survivors and groups without hearing whispers about the things lurking out there. Some had told of a giant monstrous reptile that had destroyed an entire survivor settlement in a mall outside of Nevada. Others told that one of those SCP sites was haunted. People spoke about a ghostly man who looked like a rotten corpse who could walk through walls and drag people to hell. But the things Matthew was capable of seemed to be on a whole other level. I asked him what he was, and he told me. Just a humble craftsman, my son. I enjoy creating, though admittedly my creations seem to have gotten away from me these days. His evasion was less funny than he seemed to think it was. I pressed on, asking him what exactly he was capable of. He shrugged and answered that he could do almost anything if he really put his mind to it. I asked, so... Ultimate power? This gave him a chuckle. <laughs> he shook his head and said, Let me tell you a story. A man comes upon a maze cut into a cornfield and decides he wants to try his luck. He spends hours getting to the center of the maze and there he finds the devil waiting for him. The devil says, Welcome to my domain. Your soul is now forfeit unless you can complete my challenge and win it back. Of course, the men agreed. The devil said, I can see everything, do everything, and be everything. I know every inch of the universe and can produce anything from thin air. If you want to keep your soul, name one thing I can't do. Curious, I asked, what did the man say? Matthew smiled and said, Get lost. And for the first time in those long, dark months, I actually laughed. And it was such a stupid, corny dad joke. It's a strange world we live in. Point is, Matthew continued, There is no ultimate power. Some things are denied even to God, especially when he chooses to walk as a man on the earth he created. We kept walking for hours. Matthew assured us that we would get there in time, as the rest of us got even more anxious about the thought of the rising sun. He said he'd seen so many sunrises now that he could time them to the second. In the meantime, we should enjoy getting to stretch our legs a little. Even now, the city could be beautiful at night. When he led us all the way to what seemed like an abandoned chemical plant, I could feel my heart sink. All this time, all this work, to find more people, to find safety, only to see that this place was abandoned too. 
Matthew smiled and said, That's just what they want you to think. He snapped his fingers, and the ground around us began to rumble. The concrete shifted seamlessly, and an entrance opened up below. Heavy bulkheads shifted, revealing a sleek, chrome hallway down into the ground. We were astonished. Matthew gestured down into the hall as we descended. Matthew followed us, the entrance closing behind him. I'm just warning you, he said. This may come as a bit of a shock. We ventured deeper, passing through different automated security checkpoints as cameras gazed down from above. Eventually, we found ourselves in what seemed to be a central chamber. It was a hive of activity. People in normal civilian clothes, guards in tactical gear, scientists in lab coats. Tears filled my eyes. It was the most people I'd seen in one place in months. A man in a lab coat wearing an extravagant medallion approached. He was making notes on a clipboard. Another batch of survivors! Good work, 343! The man said. Matthew smiled and nodded. No problem, Jack. Always happy to help. The man with the medallion, Jack, presumably, turned to me. I imagine you've come a long way, he said. I nodded. <laughs> you have no idea. Reality warpers. Real pieces of work, aren't they? It's one thing when an anomaly is all claws and fangs like SCP-682, or if their attack of choice is snapping necks like SCP-173. But it is an entirely different story if an anomaly can turn the air you breathe into chocolate pudding or shove you into a pocket dimension that looks almost like our own reality, except everyone is just a walking, talking pile of spiders. See what I mean? Reality warpers. Real handfuls. Though, of course, not all reality warpers are created equal. Some are relatively weak, only affecting the world around them in a mild, ambient fashion. Others can rattle whole dimensions with their tremendous power. The same also goes for morality. Some reality warpers are loving and benevolent, such as SCP-343, the kindly, old, all-powerful being known to some as God. And some are pure evil beings who want nothing more than to use their immense power to sow chaos and misery among everyone else. And personally, we can't think of a better example of the latter than Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls. This demonic Dorito wants nothing more than to take over our dimension and rebuild it in his image of absolute insanity. So naturally, we started wondering, if these two reality warping titans, SCP-343 and Bill Cipher, ever came to blows, who would win? We were so curious, in fact, that we fired up the Anomatron 6000, our state-of-the-art simulation supercomputer to see how exactly the two might meet and how their epic battle would play out. Who do you think would take the coveted W on this one? Let us know down in the comments, along with any other out-of-universe what-if situations you'd love to see. But in the meantime, Let's fire up the machine. Be warned, folks, it's gonna get weird. The date was July 12th, 2013. For SCP-343, it had started out as a relatively normal day. He'd spent the night playing solitaire on the astral plane before warping back into his humanoid containment cell by morning, leaving the Foundation none the wiser. After all, he was really here voluntarily. If the Foundation had truly wanted to try to confine him here, they were welcome to give it a go, but it would be about as effective as trying to catch a whisper in a butterfly net. While God had come to this place to experience the joyful illusion of giving up control, it truly was little more than an illusion to him. If he wanted to, he could exterminate the SCP Foundation in less than an afternoon, then retire to Burger King for a Whopper. So really, they're all just lucky he is a benevolent being more interested in hanging out than dispensing wrath on those he perceived as insolent. That was Old Testament him. He'd done a lot of soul-searching and growth since then. It'd been at least a millennium since he'd smote anyone for that matter, and the last guy really had it coming. However, today was going to be a little different. God knew that something was going to happen today. He sensed a great source of energy emerging, something dark and malevolent. He sighed and he closed his eyes for a moment, focusing himself. He knew whatever the nature of this threat, it would fall upon him to face and destroy it. How irritating. He was hoping to finally binge Stranger Things today. Elsewhere in Site-19, things seemed to be inordinately peaceful. There hadn't been any containment breaches or new anomalies brought in. There hadn't been any attacks from rival groups of interest. Dr. Bright hadn't even done anything stupid or started any fires. To borrow an old cliché, it was quiet, too quiet. 
Perhaps the only person who wasn't having a relatively mellow day was security officer Frederick Simmons, a mid-level guard who'd been stationed at Site-19 for four years now. He just wasn't really feeling himself today. The work didn't bother Simmons, emotionally at least. Typically, even after seeing rather traumatic things or being in near-death situations while in containment breaches, it hadn't left any lingering effects. But lately, he'd been having the strangest dreams. It always played out the same way. Shortly after going to sleep, he'd open his eyes in a strange multicolored void surrounded by bizarre, seemingly random floating objects, none of which seemed to have any real relevance to him or his life. And just when he'd begin to question it, the other recurring element of the dream would occur. Out of the shimmering oil slick rainbow of mind-boggling colors, a strange being would suddenly emerge. A glowing golden triangle, almost like a drawing of a pyramid, the eye of providence, with a stovepipe hat, a little bow tie, thin black arms and legs, and most notable of all, a single large eye with a slit pupil staring out from the center. The eye almost seemed to have a strange hypnotic quality to it. Simmons felt bewitched whenever he looked into it. He wasn't afraid, quite the opposite actually. For reasons he couldn't understand, this strange creature from the world of dreams seemed like a good friend of his. He said, Well, 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 if it isn't my number one guy, the Fredmeister, in the house. I've missed you. Have you missed me? Put her there, good buddy. The entity extended his hand and Simmons shook it. The Foundation Guard could feel a strange tingling sensation jolting down his arm. The first time Simmons had encountered the entity, he'd told him his name, Bill Cipher, and he told him how incredibly important it was that Simmons kept their little nighttime meetings a secret. In exchange, Bill was here to listen. Simmons would spend his time in the mindscape pouring out his worries and frustrations with his daily work, as Bill paid impeccable attention. The strange little dream entities seemed fascinated by the work Simmons did, all the peculiar and wondrous anomalies he guarded at Site-19. But to Simmons, it was all just boring work. Zombie creating supernatural plague doctors and immortal men with metal limbs lose their shine after you see them day in, day out, for years on end. Frankly, Simmons needed a day off, but he'd already used up all his PTO when he'd gotten the flu earlier that year. He just didn't know what to do. Luckily for him, Bill had a solution. Bill, as it turned out, had a fancy little ability. He could occupy the body of a human being and operate it for them. Bill could take the wheel while Simmons took a load off in the mindscape. How hard could standing around pretending to look busy at the SCP Foundation really be? As Bill explained the offer to him, Simmons couldn't really see any flaws in his reasoning. After all, Bill was a friend. Why would he have any ill will towards him? With that, he shook hands with the bizarre supernatural triangle and felt the sudden rough sensation of having his consciousness ripped from his body, only for Bill to slither in and take his place. The new Simmons, the Bill-occupied Simmons, opened up his demonic yellow eyes and grinned. He gave a demented laugh to Simmons' floated, disembodied soul. <laughs> oh man! He said, wiping away a tear of laughter with Simmons' finger. With your body, I can use the SCP Foundation's technology to take over the multiverse! See ya, sucker! And with one last demented chuckle, Bill left for work at the SCP Foundation, with Simmons being the latest in his long line of meat puppets. After arriving at Site-19, he sneaked through the facility, knowing exactly where he needed to be. You see, Bill is a native entity of the second dimension, the world of flat shapes. But he's able to access the minds of beings in the third dimension, like us, through the medium of the mindscape, rather than the physical realm. Bill's life goal has always been to find a way to permeate and take over the third dimension, turning it into his personal playground. All he needed was the right anomaly to bring him forth into our world. In this case, a little anomalous device favored by Dr. Kane Pathos Crow, SCP-158, also known as the Soul Extractor. While Dr. Crow left to the courtyard for his evening walkies, the being that most people assumed was Fred Simmons secreted himself into SCP-158's containment chamber and locked the door behind him. He didn't have much time. He'd need to do this perfectly if he wanted a real chance at taking over the universe. 
He was amused by the irony, at the least. The fact that, in order to take over, he needed to sneak into the midst of the people most likely to destroy him. Still, where's the fun in life with no risk? At SCP-158's control console, he inputted the data to soul extraction and set a timer. However, there was one difference between this and the usual procedures performed with the soul extractor. There was no containment receptacle on the other end. Whatever was extracted would just be released into the world. And this was exactly what Bill was counting on. He laid Simmons' body down on the gurney and watched with glee as the robotic arm lowered towards him. It reached into his chest and pulled out the essence of one three-sided threat to reality. Bill Cipher. One quick journey through the bowels of the machine later, the nightmare scenario had come to pass. Bill floated around the room, dragged into physical reality. He let out a long, conceited cackle and spun his cane around. This was going to be fun. Elsewhere in the facility, alarms were going off and guards were deploying. Nobody was meant to be in Containment Chamber 158, so how was the Soul Extractor currently operating? This couldn't possibly end well. Bill, on the other end, was having a wonderful time. He was pondering all the different ways he could make the drab clinical corridors of the SCP Foundation into his vision of perfect weirdness. Maybe he'd turn all the researchers into mice and turn Site-19 into a giant maze to run them through. Maybe he'd turn the air into farts and release winged beasts from the Hell Dimension to ravage humanity. Maybe he'd go out into the parking lot and key everyone's cars. Oh, the diabolical possibilities were endless. As he floated out into the hall, his fantasizing was interrupted by a group of Foundation security operatives wielding assault rifles. They entered an attack formation and trained their rifles on him before opening fire. Bill just found himself laughing again. The gunfire just tickled. Wow, you guys are hilarious! Bill said between fits of laughter. But wait, I can think of a better way to make you even funnier. He snapped his fingers and suddenly the guards were transformed. Instead of the serious first line of defense for the SCP Foundation, they were now a gang of literal clowns straight from the circus, holding balloon animals molded into the shapes of assault rifles. They giggled and threw pies at each other. Bill was right. This did make them even funnier. And he was just getting started. Turning this Foundation snooze fest into a party of cosmic proportions, Bill began running a rampage of weirdness across the site. Essentially being the ultimate cosmic troll, he decided he'd simply bother every single anomaly he could with his demonic antics. First, he appeared in SCP-096's chamber and pulled a brown paper bag over his head, with the words, Ugliness Lies Within written on the front. And just for fun, he then teleported the temperamental beast to a nearby Amish community. It quickly became enraged when a gust of wind blew the bag off its head, and a man named Jebediah saw its face. It then killed several others, also named Jebediah, during the rampage. Bill thought it was hilarious. He then released SCP-682 into Site-19, and just to annoy the creature into further violence, he stuck an indestructible party hat on the monster's head. No matter how hard 682 tried, it couldn't remove the party hat. This caused it great frustration, which it took out on any Foundation staff it happened to find in the area. It had fulfilled Bill's expectations wonderfully, but his quest for amusing carnage didn't end there. Next, he went to bother SCP-049 the Plague Doctor, who was in the process of doing surgery on a Foundation-provided dead goat. With a snap of his fingers, Bill transformed the Plague Doctor's surgical tools into colorful Play-Doh cutting tools. Needless to say, the supernatural surgeon was less than pleased. He was about as annoyed as Dr. Clef was when Bill turned his favorite shotgun into a bouquet of flowers, then sealed his feet into the floor. Or how vexed Dr. Gears was when Bill turned his plain beige necktie into a considerably more loud and colorful tie. People there at the time reported hearing Dr. Gears say, I just don't think that was necessary. Oh, and he also did some more minor acts of malice. He filled the break room with an army of flesh-eating zombies. He made a moat filled with molten lava around the site that prevented anyone from escaping from his reign of terror. And he even covered all the walls in cognito-hazardous doodles that instantly drove any weak-minded human who saw them into complete gibbering madness. It was clear this reality-warping nightmare needed to be stopped, 
before he got bored of playing with his new Foundation toys and decided to go remodel the universe in his own image. Thankfully, there was one anomaly on sight who was up to the task. Bill was treating himself to another evil laugh in the Site 19 canteen when something peculiar happened. He looked down to see a man in what looked like a tunic with graying hair and a beard. He walked with a peculiar kind of calmness, his face blank. Why wasn't this guy panicking? Was he stupid? Bill would seemingly need to teach this guy a thing or two about fear. Hey Gramps! Don't know if it's escaped your attention, but I've been giving this place an extreme makeover. Did you forget to put on your glasses this morning, or are you just that senile? The stranger remained calm as could be. He replied with a voice that was measured as it was deep. Now, Bill, let's not resort to name-calling. That's just childish, don't you think? Bill's single eye widened at this. Wait, wait, hold up. How did you know my name? Bill asked, irritated. Are you a friend of the Time Baby or something? He floated over and began circling the stranger, hoping to intimidate him. Much to Bill's frustration, it didn't appear to be working. I know lots of things, Bill. Lots of things, the stranger replied. That's my line! Bill screeched, turning red. Who do you think you are? The stranger gave a quiet, reserved chuckle that infuriated Bill. Oh, personally, I just like to think of myself as a humble craftsman, watching his beautiful creation play out, he said. But I suppose some of the people around here like to call me God. Bill didn't like this. This whole universe was going to be his, and he certainly didn't appreciate some insolent old man acting like he ran the roost around here. Bill would give him an education in who was really holding the reins, and it would be the kind of education that left scars, if it left anything at all. He extended his spindly black arms and released bolts of lightning against the stranger, who simply continued to smile as the electricity rippled around him, seemingly causing no effect. Are you done? The stranger asked. Bill laughed, hoping to hide his irritation. I'm just getting started, he bellowed. With a thunderous roar that shook the very foundations of Site-19, Bill began to grow and shift. No longer a silly little triangle, he became a huge red pyramid of pure nightmares, covered in glowing golden arms and teeth, with long black tongues drooping out of each level. It was the most terrifying and demonic form in his entire arsenal, and yet he was astonished to find that the stranger still didn't seem to show any kind of fear. Very impressive, Bill, the stranger said, sounding almost bored. But I think you might be trying a little too hard. Oh, that does it. Bill would simply have to destroy him. It was a matter of pride now. He raised several of his huge golden fists and began pounding down on the comparatively tiny humanoid stranger. It was an assault so powerful that the ground began cracking around their feet, and yet it seemed that with almost no effort, the stranger was able to intercept and block every single blow. Naturally, Bill was infuriated. It was time to finally unleash the full breadth of his power on this beardy wise guy. He launched thunderbolts, fireballs, legions of giant mutant wasps, hailstorms, maelstroms, bubbles of pure madness, snakes made out of barbed wire, and even incredible coarse language. But despite it all, this man, the one who claimed people called him God, was utterly unfazed. You can dish it out, he said. But let's see if you can take it. Bill began to laugh. What the heck's that supposed to mean? You can't- God snapped his fingers, and Bill was gone vanished, and with a flick of his wrist, all the damage and transformations that Bill had performed had disappeared. It was as though the demonic triangle had never even been there in the first place. Though Dr. Bright, who was acting site director at the time, had some Scranton reality anchors turned on around the perimeter just to be safe. You can never be too careful with reality warping demons, after all. Later that day, Dr. Bright approached God and asked him what he'd actually done with Bill. God chuckled and replied, for a being of such immense power, he really had a rather childish mindset, so I sealed him away inside a children's cartoon where he couldn't do any further damage. What was the cartoon? Dr. Bright asked. A charming little Disney show called Gravity Falls, God replied. Addiction. It takes many forms and wears many faces, like a demon walking among us. It takes over your life, crawling in and changing you from the inside out. Breaking an addiction is hard, 
but oftentimes not giving it up is much harder. That was a difficult lesson to learn for three people. Joey Walker, Dolly McGregor, and Paul Abels. These three had never met one another, and now they never will. But each one of them had two things in common. First was that each had an addiction they felt like they couldn't shake. And second was that they each had a run-in with SCP-666. Joey Walker was at the end of his rope when he encountered it. Everyone has bad days, but for Joey every day for the last 15 years has been a bad day. He was pushing 40 with nothing to show for it, except credit card debt, a scraggly beard, and a beat up old Mustang. But booze had always been there for him. No matter how bad things got, he could always count on a glass full of comfort at the end of the day. But to paraphrase a quote by Stephen King, sometimes when a man takes a drink, the drink takes the man and Joey Walker had been long since taken. He was a transient worker, doing jobs wherever jobs needed doing, but he never expected that he would end up all the way to Tibet working construction. Not that he was complaining. Sure, it was cold, but there was plenty of Tibetan Chang to enjoy. It was a drink so good that legends even say that yetis would raid villages in the mountains just to get a little taste. Joey had taken a liking to the Chang, and it was what he had been drinking when he crashed his car up in the mountains, leaving him stranded in the snow. Joey had survived the crash itself, but he knew he wouldn't last long in the cold. He needed shelter. That's why he felt like he could hardly believe his luck when he first saw the yurt, a kind of traditional Tibetan tent made from animal skins. Joey had never seen anything quite like it, but any refuge from the storm would do. He pushed forward through the snow and climbed inside. But the inside of the yurt was nothing like the outside. In fact, it seemed like an exact replica of his favorite sports bar back in Atlantic City. It was warm. There was all the old memorabilia on the walls. And every screen was showing the Saints wiping the floor with the Colts in the 2010 Super Bowl. Joey didn't even question it. He just smiled and approached the bar. He even recognized the bartender, Malcolm a good old friend of his. Malcolm smiled back at him, but there was something oddly menacing in his grin. Welcome back, he said. I thought you'd hauled your sorry keister off to Tibet. Guess you gave up on that too, just like everything else. <laughs> well, except... Malcolm pushed a glass of beer towards him across the bar and glared. Joey didn't understand why Malcolm was being so aggressive, but he didn't question that either. He grabbed the glass and drank it up, guzzling it down before slamming the empty glass down on the bar. Malcolm kept the drinks coming, round after round, and Joey kept knocking them back. He didn't notice when the TV screens turned to static. He didn't notice when the other patrons at the bar began to jitter and twitch, turning little by little into something less than human. He didn't even notice when Malcolm's face started melting off his skull as long as he kept pouring. Before he could even really understand what was happening to him, Joey Walker was dead. His liver and kidneys had given out on him. His corpse would later be found frozen on the Tibetan mountainside, just 30 feet away from his crash car. The coroner's report would list his cause of death as accidental, but this was no accident. He'd fallen victim to SCP-666 an anomalous yurt known to some as the Spirit House. The being he'd call Malcolm is known to the Foundation as SCP-666-1, and Joey had failed its challenge. Sadly for our inebriated friend, the penalty for failure is death. Next on our list of human tragedies comes Dolly McGregor, a 62-year-old woman from Anaheim, California. Dolly was never averse to the drink, but she knew how to enjoy her mojitos in moderation. You rarely get to 62 if you don't. And Dolly could tell people with pride that she had two children and six grandchildren, whom she didn't see nearly often enough for her liking. She also had over $100,000 in gambling debt owed to a number of casinos on the Vegas Strip. Ever since her husband Albert had passed away several years prior, shooting craps, playing blackjack, and willing away the hours in front of the slot machines had been a welcome change from loneliness. But in Vegas, fortunes can change in an instant. Dolly had gone from being on a hot winning streak to losing everything. The casinos extended her lines of credit until she was gambling with money she'd never be able to pay back. But that didn't stop her. She'd been selling off everything, 
even remortgaging the house that Albert had built with his own two hands to try and keep up with her ballooning debts. Still, it wasn't enough, but she couldn't stop either. It wasn't even that she felt good about it anymore. It was just that she only ever felt normal among the flashing lights of slot machines and the clatter of dice. She needed to get away, as far away as possible. She heard about people reaching spiritual enlightenment in Tibet. They'd discover God, or gods, or sometimes just a sense of inner peace. Whatever it was, she needed to find it and get this demon off her back. So she took the last of her savings and flew off to Tibet to clear her head. She didn't know if there were any casinos in Lhasa, but if there were, her money would surely be no good there. It was exactly what she needed. But Tibet wasn't the promised land she thought it would be. Wherever Dolly went, there she was, with the same vices and demons chasing her. The first night she spent in Lhasa, she used the hotel Wi-Fi to download an online poker app on her phone. This culminated in another couple thousand dollars lost, and a panic attack that caused Dolly to throw her phone into her toilet before wandering off into the wilderness. She just needed to get away. But time and space got away from her, and eventually she was knee-deep in snow. Where had she come from? Where could she go? It quickly dawned on her that if she didn't find some kind of shelter soon, she'd be done for. But all she could do was keep walking. That's when she happened upon SCP-666. The yurt was like an oasis on the barren mountainside. She didn't expect comfort inside, but it could at least provide her some shelter until the staff back at the hotel noticed she was gone. Then they'd come and save her, right? Right. But when she passed through the yak leather flap into the yurt, Dolly wasn't in an ancient tent in the Tibetan wilderness. She was on a casino floor. There was a big, beautiful roulette table before her, attended to by a grinning, well-dressed croupier. They were flanked by an army of slot machines, and all the pleasing, familiar sounds of cheerful gambling rang out through the air. She approached the table, and the croupier shook his head in what seemed like disappointment. Ah, back again, eh, Dolly? He said with a sigh. Of course, I should have expected it. After all, what else do you have in that empty little life of yours, hmm? Without all this, you'd be nothing, right? Nothing at all. Since Albert died and the kids want nothing to do with you, we're all you've got. So Dolly, what'll it be? Red or black? Are you feeling lucky? His words wounded Dolly, but that wouldn't stop her. She grabbed her chips and put them all on red. One last spin couldn't hurt. What did she have to lose? She blinked, and she wasn't sitting at the table anymore. She was upright, but she wasn't standing. Her wrists and ankles were bound to something, to a wheel, a giant roulette wheel, like it was some kind of medieval torture device. The croupier was standing across from her, well, something that used to be a croupier. His face was flickering in and out. Sometimes it was human, sometimes it was a mass of eyes and teeth. More demons were sitting all at the slot machines behind him, pulling levers made from human bones. Good choice, Dolly, the croupier said. Red suits you. He reached out and gave the wheel a spin. Dolly was lost in an overwhelming, pulsing cascade of lights, colors, and sounds. The horrific, tinny noises of slot machines and the laughter of the demonic croupier. She was lost in panic and terror as she just kept spinning and spinning and spinning. When her body was eventually found, her muscles were in the advanced stages of atrophy, as though she hadn't been moving for years. Her brain was rotted, and the cause of death was determined as sudden cardiac arrest after an extended period of sleep deprivation and malnutrition. Dolly's family would never really know what happened to her. The SCP Foundation has learned a lot about SCP-666 after containing it in Site-73. Its anomalous effects, namely vivid, complex, and potentially fatal hallucinatory experiences only affect those with some kind of addiction or dependency. To anyone else entering the yurt, it's just a normal tent. But any addicts who enter will fall under its spell, and are generally transported back to the place where their addiction was at its strongest. There they'll encounter SCP-666-1, an entity that takes the form of a figure from the subject's life, normally one heavily involved in facilitating their addiction. Any kind of addiction seems to trigger it. 
alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography, food, self-destructive behavior, even video games. SCP-666 kills its victims with a twisted mockery of the very thing that they were dependent on in life. It was only with Paul Abels that the Foundation started discovering the other side of the coin. By almost all accounts, Paul is a worse person than anyone on this list. He got addicted to hard drugs early on in life and took up a life of violent crime to support his habit. He murdered two people during a liquor store robbery before being convicted and sentenced to death. He'd then been picked up as a D-class by the SCP Foundation and selected as a test subject for SCP-666 due to his history of drug abuse. The Foundation expected to be adding his body to the incineration pile sometime soon. None of the researchers working on the case predicted what actually ended up happening. Paul was forced to enter the yurt. Not long after, he found himself standing in a place he'd done everything to try to forget. The dark, graffiti-stained alley where he'd been sold his first hit. This was the place. The place that destroyed his life. Every bad decision he'd ever made could be traced back to here, and specifically to one man, Frank. Frank was his first dealer, and now here he was, standing right across from him once more. Frank was grinning like a demon. Come on, Polly, he said. You got it, Trash. We both know what you're gonna do. Don't you feel it? The itch? Come on, one more hit, Polly. That's all you need to feel better. It's time to take your medicine. Frank, or this thing pretending to be Frank, was right. He did feel the itch. He did want it. Maybe he was no better than this. He began to reach out towards Frank, but then he abruptly pulled his hand back. Frank's eyes widened in genuine surprise as Paul replied, I'm sorry, that's not me anymore. SCP-666-1 gave a smile and said, Maybe it isn't, Polly. Maybe it isn't. When Paul Abels was removed from the SCP-666 yurt by one of the attending guards, the Foundation researchers discovered something amazing. Paul was very much alive, and more incredibly, he didn't feel the cravings anymore. His addiction was gone. And further tests showed that Paul wasn't a one-off event. In fact, anyone who denies the temptation of SCP-666 will see their addictions miraculously disappear when they finally leave. After this, it became clear to the Foundation that SCP-666 isn't just a way to punish addicts. It's a kind of test. Those who want to change, who are willing to truly confront their demons and resist the pull of temptation are rewarded with the one thing they want most in their life. Freedom from their addiction. SCP-666 can be your doom or your salvation. And like most things in life, you get what you give. One fine morning. Your distant Aunt Carol came to your family home in an almost frantic state of excitement. Carol had always been a bit eccentric, totally harmless of course, but what you'd describe as being on the more zealous side of religious. Predictably, she wanted to ask you and your family to come to church with her. Seeing as you don't see Aunt Carol often, you and your family decide that there's no harm in indulging her. You're not an atheist family by any means. In fact, you were all raised Catholic, but it felt like it'd been forever since you last went to church. Aunt Carol wanted to show you and your family the special celebrations that went on at her church. You remember her practically grabbing you by the wrist and dragging you to the building, her eyes filled with a crazed enthusiasm. That's when you saw something incredibly strange. There were shadows moving behind the elaborate stained glass windows, thousands of tiny shadows darting around, and this low humming noise you faintly recognized. What was that noise? It was the cry of cicadas, but this was only early spring. What were cicadas doing awake at this time of year? You didn't get much time to ponder this question. In the next few seconds, you and the entire church were surrounded by heavy-duty tactical vehicles. What appeared to be a large and heavily armed SWAT team poured out of the vehicles. Unbeknownst to you, these were a mobile task force sent in by the SCP Foundation, specifically MTF Y99, also known as the Altar Boys a specially trained group of Foundation agents used for anomalies of a religious nature. You, your aunt, and the rest of your family are rounded up to be debriefed and given amnestics. One of the last memories they took from you was the sight of Foundation agents dragging bloody bodies out of the church. 
As the doors opened, thousands of cicadas streamed out and disappeared into the skies. But these weren't like any kind of cicada you'd ever seen. They were beautiful. Their rainbow-colored wings reminded you of ornate stained glass. Who could have guessed that these pretty little bugs are tied to an entity very likely to bring about an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario someday in the future? The bugs, the bodies in the church, and even your aunt's incredibly strange behavior all fall underneath the umbrella of a Keter-class anomaly known as SCP-3004. But to truly understand this anomaly that was once thought to be destroyed, and the implications of it still living today, we need to go back 600 years to Ireland in the 15th century. This era was believed to be the origin of a Gaelic religious movement known as Caitlagi, or the Singers in English, a splinter sect of Druidism. But this was no fringe cult. The Singers were a mainstream religion in the British Isles for several hundred years. Its members included people of all social classes, from lowly peasants to powerful and respected figures. They mingled heavily with Christians, mostly Irish Catholics, and at some point in history came close to overtaking Christianity as the dominant religion in Ireland. So, who were these people, if they're supposedly such a large part of recent history in the area? Like most Druids, their relationship with nature was a key part of their belief system. In particular, they prized an extinct species of cicada known as Cicadetta luculenta, or the stained glass cicada in English. The life cycle of birth and resurrection that the cicadas underwent fascinated the singers, and they performed a number of holy rituals around it. One recorded ritual was the celebration of children entering adulthood that was marked by them first losing their baby teeth. But the rituals of the singers accidentally opened some kind of door to a being from a different plane of reality, dubbed SCP-3004-1 by the Foundation. This being is an immensely powerful thought form that the Foundation believes to be a pittisphage, or faith eater. It appears to have been attracted to our universe by the rituals of the singers, and so took a form relevant to their beliefs, namely a huge cicada, in order to feed on their faith. If things had stopped there, then this would be an almost innocent symbiotic relationship, but the interactions between SCP-3004-1 and our world led to dangerous consequences due to its powerful reality-warping abilities. For example, during some rituals, huge numbers of stained-glass cicadas would burst from the mouths of those participating, often causing them to choke to death. Other times, 3004-1 would manifest physically in the sky above its new worshippers, causing painful boils on whoever witnessed it, and occasionally symptoms akin to radiation sickness. It appeared that 3004-1 was growing more powerful over time, and its rise to power was intrinsically linked to the rituals of the singers and the existence of the stained glass cicadas. Two groups that predated the Foundation, the Vatican's Congregation for Otherworldly Acts, and the English government's Royal Society for the Imprisonment of Abnormality essentially performed an all-out religious genocide on the singers. No meaningful trace of the religion was left when they were done, aside from their own records. While they were at it, they also exterminated all the stained glass cicadas, leading to a complete stop of all SCP-3004 activity. It seemed like despite the great human and ecological cost, the anomaly had been neutralized. A few centuries later, though, a series of strange, cicada-related anomalous events started to occur across the United States. A strange man, seemingly made almost entirely from cicada chitin, would appear at christenings, weddings, and funerals. Each time his presence would cause the people in attendance to do and experience horrific things and lead to legacies of hardship and death that would linger for decades. This became known as SCP-2852, or Cousin Johnny and it should have been the first clue that the nightmare of SCP-3004 was resurfacing. But since 3004 was already archived as neutralized, nobody made the connection. Some time later, SCP-2852 incidents ceased, and around that exact time, SCP-3004 instances started anew. It manifested in the form of strange, anomalous activities taking place at Christian church services, specifically those from Roman Catholic, Eastern Catholic, Anglican, and Episcopalian communities. The only clues to outsiders would be an increase in reported church attendance and an increase in deaths from natural causes within the community. These two stats were how the Foundation first noticed something was amiss. 
just as it had done with the singers centuries before. SCP-3004-1 had latched onto the beliefs and rituals of Christians, and was using this new connection to harvest more faith for sustenance. The results were twofold. First, religious fervor and excitement to attend church services saw a huge increase. Secondly, the actual content of these services took a hard turn for the horrific. Much like Cousin Johnny infiltrations, this really isn't for the faint of heart by any definition. For example, young people with Christ-like stigmata wounds being bitten to death by priests, children removing the teeth of priests before they all start vomiting huge numbers of stained glass cicadas. There were extremely unpleasant rituals involving castration, and even a pregnant woman giving birth to even more swarms of stained glass cicadas. We could go on, but you probably get the idea. Rituals inspired by SCP-3004-1 are horrific, and all seem to involve the same extinct breed of stained glass cicadas worshipped by the singers before their annihilation. But how can these insects, which have been dubbed SCP-3004-2, be here in the present if the Foundation forerunners made them extinct so many centuries ago? The answer is simple, but strange. While they have all the hallmarks of being alive, the stained glass cicadas present during modern iterations of SCP-3004 events aren't actually real. Genetic tests have shown that they're actually made from a mix of wood and real stained glass. These insects fly away from the scene after the rituals are completed, traveling around 600 miles from the site before disappearing completely. The Foundation was growing concerned about the nature of SCP-3004, especially given that instances were becoming more frequent and harder to contain. Foundation scientists determined that the creature known as 3004-1 likely existed within a layer of reality just above our own, and if it ever managed to breach our reality, the world level of violence and chaos it could cause would likely lead to an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Drastic actions would once again be needed to prevent this, so they devised an emergency containment procedure that would only be used as a last resort. The procedure, known as Protocol Damantio Ad Bestias, would use a mixture of mass amnestic treatment and thaumial objects to completely erase Christianity from not only the modern world, but all of history, in hopes of cutting off SCP-3004-1's food supply to kill the entity, or at least prevent it from entering our world. The plan would center on placing a powerful Roman Catholic reality warper, who volunteered for the job of course, into an anomalous group of machines known as the Lions. By submitting the Reality Warper to a lifetime of suffering and essentially erasing him from existence, so too will it erase the world's full knowledge of Christianity and hopefully save the world. This man will become the last martyr, dying for all of humanity. He will become the last saint, St. Jude the Damned, Bulwark Against Darkness. You might ask, are you sure that's necessary? There's so much we don't know about 3004-1. Do we know for a fact that it's dangerous? Enter Agent Timothy Lutterman, a member of Mobile Task Force Sigma-25, also known as Ghostbusters. Lutterman was part of a foundation project known as Site C Lux, using an astral projection technology that would free his consciousness from his body and allow it to travel freely between metaphysical planes. In plain English, they could use Lutterman's floating mind as a kind of spy and insert it into 3004-1's dimension. They achieved this by capturing one of 3004-1's false stained glass cicadas and releasing it again, allowing Lutterman's mind to follow it home to its master. However, what we thought would be a simple intel gathering mission turned into a complete nightmare. Lutterman found that 3004-1's dimension was entirely void, aside from the entity itself and the millions of buzzing stained glass cicadas. The entity was so huge and so complex that it physically hurt to look at. Letterman observed that its form kept shifting, from a giant cicada, to an old man, to a cicada nailed to a wooden cross, to an infinite mess of wood and stained glass. But even more terrifying than its physical appearance were the contents of its mind. 3004-1 forced itself into Agent Letterman's brain, and in that moment, he finally understood it. The entity, which had no concept of metaphors, allegory, or the divide between fact and fiction, truly believed that it was the Abrahamic God depicted in the Bible, and that all Christians are lovingly worshipping it. In its rituals, it was imposing some of the bloodiest parts of the Bible onto its flock, believing that's what they wanted. All the while, it fed on their faith, growing bigger and more powerful. 
Letterman found that just being there with the creature was hurting his soul. If it wasn't a god yet, he believed it had the power to become one in time, and he advised the Foundation shouldn't send anyone else to its dimension. It was too great a risk to all life on Earth. Perhaps to prevent the horrible fate of all of us being destroyed by 3004-1, erasing Christianity would be a worthy sacrifice. That is, if it actually works. After all, they thought destroying the Singers would neutralize 3004 once and for all. And yet, here it is again. For all we know, we may just be prolonging the inevitable. If you've ever studied ancient Egypt in your history class, then you're probably familiar with the way they buried their pharaohs. When a king of Egypt died, their body would be entombed in a huge sarcophagus, usually after being mummified. Mummification was the process that the ancient Egyptians used to preserve their dead, safeguarding a corpse with special chemicals and the application of cloth almost like bandages. This was done to keep cadavers from decaying, usually because of the belief that this would carry over into the afterlife. And it wasn't just the Egyptians that practiced mummification either. Mummies of human beings or animals have been found on almost every continent in the world. Sometimes a body can even be accidentally mummified, through exposure to extreme cold, lack of oxygen, or other environmental factors that help keep the deceased preserved. Fun fact, the oldest recorded mummy isn't even one left behind by the ancient Egyptians. It is actually a naturally mummified severed head, estimated to be 6,000 years old. It was unearthed in South America in 1936. Yes, corpse preservation techniques can indeed be strange, but none are stranger than SCP-1176, also known by the nickname, The Mellified Man. Now, as you may have already pieced together, The Mellified Man is a mummified corpse, but not quite like the ones you would expect to find buried in the pyramids. Estimated by Foundation researchers to have been a man in his mid-30s when he died, SCP-1176 is a corpse that has degraded so much over the centuries that it has made DNA examination impossible. According to some of the SCP Foundation's best minds, SCP-1176 is possibly of Arabian ancestry, and thought to have passed away sometime during either the 10th or the 11th centuries AD. This is certainly not your ordinary mummy, and it definitely isn't like the kind you'd see in a cheesy black and white horror movie or on an old episode of Scooby-Doo. SCP-1176 is absolutely, undoubtedly dead by all clinical definitions. It doesn't show any signs of breathing and the processes of blood circulation or metabolism have long since stopped. However, despite the decay suffered by the rest of the body, SCP-1176's brain seems to have remained intact for almost 10 whole centuries. Not just intact, but active. The Foundation's researchers have confirmed that the brain has a constant level of electrical activity, consistent with people experiencing stage 3 non-rapid eye movement sleep, known colloquially as deep sleep. So, a mummy with an active, albeit dormant brain. How does an ancient culture manage to achieve preservation like this? Alien technology? Cryogenic sleep chambers? Suspended animation? No, not quite. SCP-1176 exists in its current state in part because the body has been mellified. Now this was a process a lot like mummification, but instead of wrapping them in cloth, a mellified man or a human mummy confection was created by submerging a dead body in honey. According to historical records, elderly men in Arabic countries would sometimes willingly volunteer themselves for this process. Why? Because the goal was to turn their bodies into a healing confection. In other words, an elaborate sweet delicacy created from a preserved corpse. That's right, ancient cultures had candy made from dead people. All the information the Foundation has gathered about SCP-1176 seems to point to the body being one such mellified man. When extracting the remaining bodily fluids from the corpse, instead of finding blood or other normal substances, Foundation researchers discovered that SCP-1176 was full of a viscous, gold-colored liquid that they designated as SCP-1176-1. Further testing of this fluid revealed it to be, you guessed it, honey. Specifically, it was a type known as clover honey, made by a species called the Anatolian honeybee. This stuff was everywhere, filling SCP-1176 entirely. So much so that honey was even coming out of the body's pores. This is due to the nature of the mellification process. 
Typically before death, a person who had offered to sacrifice their own body would stop eating any food. Instead, their diet would consist solely of honey and nothing else. They would even bathe in it, submerging their entire body in the substance inside and out until their sweat and even their feces were pure honey. This honey-only diet would eventually kill the donor and their corpse would be placed in a stone coffin, which was also filled up with even more honey. After approximately 100 years, what would be left was human mummy confection, a honey-based candy of sorts that could be then sold at street markets for a high-value price. Why was it so expensive? Well, not just because it was literally made from a dead person, but also because this confection was believed to possess rare and powerful healing properties. Everything from the common cold to broken bones was said to be cured by it. Despite it leaking out of SCP-1176, the honey doesn't seem to ever run out even when tested under varying conditions. It seems like the mellified man actively produces more of the sweet golden substance, acting as the source rather than a container with a finite amount. And yes, it is still edible after several centuries. In fact, it contains an abundance of essential vitamins and nutrients. According to the Foundation's testing, the honey produced by SCP-1176 can suppress the feeling of hunger for up to 18 whole hours and there are no long-term side effects for most that eat it. However, this is not the case for everyone. The Foundation has learned that any person without the blood type AB positive will have a severe allergic reaction should they consume any of SCP-1176-1. The symptoms include acute humulosis, which means the red blood cells won't break down properly, and renal failure which is when the kidneys stop functioning. This all results in death for most of the subjects without AB-positive blood who were fed SCP-1176-1. The symptoms for these unlucky people were the same as receiving an incompatible blood type after a transfusion. In 1985, the SCP Foundation launched a raid on a facility in Asmara, Eritrea, which at the time was owned by a group called the Mana Charitable Foundation. Agents had been dispatched to this facility after various rumors and reports that pointed to this location being the source of a strange honey substance. This anomalous liquid was being shipped to a number of areas in Ethiopia that had been stricken with famine. Pretty easy to guess where the Mana Charitable Foundation got all that honey, right? The problem was, because SCP-1176-1 caused adverse effects on people without AB-positive blood, a considerable amount of civilians had died from consuming it. Hence, the SCP Foundation was forced to step in. When SCP-1176 was first uncovered, the body had been stored inside a large stone sarcophagus, as was part of the ancient practice of creating a mellified man. There was also a copper pipe and spigot, installed by the Mana Charitable Foundation to extract the honey from within. The lid, sides, and inside of the sarcophagus itself had a number of Egyptian hieroglyphics inscribed within. These were mostly spells and ceremonial texts written as a way to protect the individual that was to become the mellified man. There were also inscriptions written in the dialect that was an early precursor to the Arabic language, However, these sections had been replaced with updated versions in classical Arabic. One of these read, Abdallah ibn Salah ibn Ayyub ibn Nasir, 15th son of the great sheikh illegible, was put to the fast of honey on the 1st of Rajab in the year of the Hijra 3 illegible and died on the 15th of Ramadan. The great Imam al-Yusuf has sealed him within the ancient vessel, marked with the signs decreed by the ancients to ferment in honey for 100 years and bring aid to the people in time of need. Much like a headstone used to mark the grave of someone who has passed, the sarcophagus that SCP-1176 was in featured a passage commemorating a man who gave his life and body to heal others. Sounds nice, right? But there was another inscription, written elsewhere on the stone sarcophagus, which translated a dire warning. Beware, Imam, for the mark of Iblis is upon this one. According to the rest of the second inscription, the tomb containing SCP-1176 had been opened before. During a time of great famine, Imam al-Malik had ordered it to be opened so that SCP-1176-1 honey could be used to feed the starving people. Jars upon jars were filled with the anomalous golden liquid and brought to the sheikh, the ruler of the land, as well as sent to the people suffering from the lack of food. However, the very next day a number of these people fell ill stricken by a terrible fever that ultimately claimed their lives. 
Only the Sheik, his brothers, and his sons, who had all eaten the honey, survived. Any others who hadn't been killed by the fever accused the Sheik and his family of sorcery, and these surviving subjects attempted to destroy the body that had produced this cursed nectar. But when the Sheik's people found the mellified man, they witnessed in horror as the body stood upright, dancing around as it screamed and taunted the people. Al-Malik declared that the devil himself sent an evil spirit to corrupt SCP-1176. The honey confection was meant to be a means of healing, but it had been corrupted. The sarcophagus was then sealed, and the inscription on it finished with the following caution to any that found it. May God strike down any who would break these seals. Countless centuries later, once the SCP Foundation had recovered SCP-1176 and the sarcophagus containing it, they began testing with the mellified man. Their goal was to determine how much of the SCP-1176-1 honey the ancient corpse could produce, perhaps in the hopes of using this substance as a form of hunger-relieving field ration for their operatives. Removing the body from its sarcophagus, Foundation researchers placed SCP-1176 on a metal grate designed to drain the honey as it was produced instead of allowing it to build up. Over the course of several hours, more and more honey seemed to be produced, beginning at a rate of almost a liter per hour to almost 56 liters every hour. But then, after ten and a half hours of producing what seemed like an endless flow of honey, something unexpected happened. The deceased body of the mellified man, dead for hundreds if not thousands of years, woke up. Foundation staff detected a spike in brain activity. If you cast your mind back to earlier, you'll remember that SCP-1176's brain had managed to survive and stay intact long after it should have decayed. The mellified man opened his eyes and immediately started to wildly flail around. He made a number of distressed sounds, the long dead body trying to crawl towards the outskirts of the testing chamber. Thanks to so many of its organs and muscles having withered away over the years, SCP-1176 was barely able to see or understand its surroundings. It couldn't speak, not properly anyway, given that its tongue had long since decayed. The Foundation's personnel moved in to try and restrain the ancient and now animated body, hoping to sedate it before SCP-1176 caused any lasting damage to itself. Eventually, staff were able to force SCP-1176 back into its sarcophagus, slamming the stone lid back in place and trapping it within. They could hear the once-human creature screeching and vocalizing from inside, bashing against the inside of the stone coffin with its head and limbs. It took three whole hours of this for the mellified man to return to its usual state, by which time its ancient bones were fractured beyond repair. SCP-1176 is a sad tale of a man who had willingly given his life to be a source of healing for people in need. He allowed himself to be mellified, turning into a confection that could bring an end to famine. And yet somehow, this was corrupted and turned into something that spread fever and pestilence. For now, the mellified man sleeps, but his brain is still alive inside. While he might be asleep, he may never be able to rest. In 1961, the SCP Foundation discovered a town that was completely devoid of all life. Not long before their arrival, Darrington, North Carolina had been a community with high aspirations, a deeply religious township of devout Christians, many of whom were seeking greater prosperity from their lives. But now their home was a ghost town, with no sign of any prior Darrington resident to be found. Where in the hell had they all gone? It hardly seemed like the population of an entire town would all simultaneously decide to up sticks and leave two pastures new. But then again, maybe the citizens of Darrington hadn't left at all. Perhaps they weren't even really still human, and had taken up residence somewhere much darker, like underground. This is the story of one of the earliest known instances of a phenomenon now known under the designation of SCP-3089 or to use its alternative name, that old-time religion. When the SCP Foundation arrived in a desolate Darrington to find the townsfolk had all vanished, they immediately began an investigation into the exact hows and whys, the answers to what exactly had happened here. After all, while not a huge place, Darrington was home to nearly a thousand residents, and that many people don't just disappear, if they even had disappeared and weren't just dormant. 
But what the Foundation uncovered was a gruesome discovery that led them to not only demolishing the entire North Carolinian town, but purchasing all the land around it to keep the area under permanent observation. Prior to the demolition, however, the Ministry of Sevenfold Blessing had been one of the oldest buildings in Darrington, much like most town churches. And it was while searching the offices of this church that the Foundation cleanup crews discovered their first piece of evidence, the initial clue about what had happened to this deserted town. They recovered a series of cassette tapes, each with a recording of sermons that had been given within the Ministry of Sevenfold Blessing. These were all delivered by one pastor, Bartholomew Jenner, the first having been recorded on August 17th of 1959, two years earlier. My friends, I want to talk to you about what the Bible offers tonight, Pastor Jenner began in the first of these recordings. I want to talk to you about what you are owed. I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to those of you who are struggling right now. To those of you who have hardship and pain. Maybe you've heard that the Bible only nourishes the spirit, that God only provides for our immortal souls. Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you that this is simply not true. Pastor Bartholomew Jenner seemed to be focused on the discussion of very real, relatable problems. After all, what person hasn't felt unsatisfied with their life at one point or another? And this was apparently no different for the people of Darrington. Many of you can think of places in your lives where you have not yet risen, where you are not yet victorious. Marriage, finances, hell. But do not fret, my friends, God wants you to rise. He has cleared a path for you. It is one littered with his earthly treasures. To claim them, you only need to shed your old selves and be reborn. The pastor was merely using the shared faith of the township to help reaffirm that their struggles were not the be-all and all of their lives. Or at least, that's how it first appeared. But the religious practices taking place in this first recording would soon take a bizarre turn, making it clear there was something far more sinister, even cult-like, going on in the Ministry of Seventhfold Blessing. Now, if you would, some of the ladies from the mayor's office were kind enough to collect these cicada shells. Pass along, each of you take one. Yes, the children too. Be careful, very careful. They are fragile. Each of you take one and hold it in your left hand. Yes, the left hand, not the right. Your left. The shells of dead cicadas hardly seem like common fare for a sermon like this. Although as the recording continued, it was easy to understand that Pastor Jenner intended these discarded insect carapaces to be something of a metaphor, even if they were pretty gross, especially to some of the younger members of his congregation. He explained to the Darrington residents that these cicada shells were meant to be symbolic of whatever hardship the citizens were currently struggling with in their lives, whether it was work, a marriage, or an ill family member. Then came the next part of this unorthodox practice. The pastor instructed everyone in the congregation to picture themselves holding their biggest problem in their left hand. Now I want you to squeeze your left hand. Squeeze it into a fist. Feel that problem cracking like old dried out paper. Feel it crumble to dust, Jenner told them, and the residents of Darrington did so, crushing the cicada shells until there was nothing left. Everyone open your eyes. Don't you feel better? Stronger. This is what is offered. Our hardships are like the shell. We shall cast them aside even as they crumble. God has cleared a path. Needless to say, the Foundation agents that recovered the tapes of Pastor Jenner's odd sermons weren't exactly sure what to make of them. And as unusual as they were, the recordings did little to indicate where the townspeople of Darrington, North Carolina had disappeared to. But as they listened further, what they found was even more unsettling than an entire congregation of people crushing cicada shells. In the second recording, dated December 19th of 1959, Pastor Jenner was once again presiding over his congregation. He had just finished quoting a passage from Matthew chapter 25, verse 30, which related to a biblical tale known as the Parable of the Talents. In this story, a master puts his servants in charge of a differently sized portion of his wealth while he is away then judges them based on whether or not his servants make a profit using his money. The third servant, who had received the least talents, meaning an amount of money, was punished for burying his share in the ground, cast out into the outer darkness, to face weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was after making mention of this unprofitable servant that Pastor Jenner went on to address even more of the bizarre, almost ritualistic practices he had been introducing to his sermons. 
Now, some of you have expressed concerns over the new sacraments. A few have even called them sacrilege. And yet, have we not prospered? Have these same naysayers, these same doubting Thomases, not profited from our good works? The pastor declared. I have shown you how to heal the sick with the Lord's prayer and the blood of an unbaptized child. I have shown you how to see your future in the stemming entrails of a quivering crow. I have shown you the path to glory, but I cannot make you follow this path. I can only show it to you. It is you and you alone who must follow it who must rise and shed your old self. Shed your old self. The words immediately called to mind the image of the cicadas, insects that discard their outer carapaces and emerge anew, bugs that also burrow into the ground and wait, lying dormant under the earth for years at a time, all before they emerge, rising up again, so they can spread. It was becoming clear that Pastor Jenner was certainly deviating further and further from the church's normal religious practices. His bold and blatant descriptions of what sounded like ritualistic sacrifices were shocking enough to hear, speaking of using blood and entrails to bring the town the prosperity it sought. But if that wasn't bad enough, the worst was still yet to come, contained within the third and final recording. Unlike the previous cassettes, most of the sermon from June 7, 1960 was almost completely unintelligible and without any visual evidence to go along with it. It was hard for the Foundation to make out exactly what was going on. It began with another quote from Matthew, this time chapter 28, verse 6, which made mention of the resurrection of Jesus, that he had risen, and that people should come and see where the Lord lay. Not a metaphor, my friend. Pastor Jenner explained before urging his congregation to join in some kind of formation. Step forward, mothers behind their daughters, fathers behind their sons. Turn to face the, uh... The recording became unintelligible again after that point, with only a few more words being audible. The pastor seemed to have gathered the townsfolk of Darrington, presumably for some new form of ritual. He encouraged the town's children to close their eyes and pray, before reminding the congregation that God sacrificed the life of his only son, Jesus. Frighteningly, it appeared that Pastor Jenner was implying the adults of Darrington should do the same. One of the next fragments of his sermon that could be deciphered declared, Lamb is slaughtered to feed the lion, the son is slaughtered to feed. Between more and more noise interfering with the recording, Pastor Jenner could be heard saying, The pact is complete. This world shall be our paradise. Before he encouraged his congregation, or those who were left, to dig deep and wait. Then came perhaps the most horrifying part of the tape. The remainder of the recording lasted 30 minutes, comprised of pure static. Or the Foundation agents listening to it assumed at first that it was just interference, but further audio analysis seemed to suggest that the long, continuous mass of hissing wasn't static at all. It was the chittering sound of insects, like the noise made by cicadas. For a time, the incident at Darrington left the Foundation baffled. There seemed to be no clear answer as to what had happened. Not one of the town's residents were anywhere to be found. And on top of that, there were no bodies. No remains of any kind to speak of. If they were dead, there would at least be some kind of trace. And then there were all the questions raised by Pastor Bartholomew Jenner's strange sermons. Why did he seem so focused on enacting rituals? Did any of his methods really benefit the town? And why did he place so much emphasis on cicadas, of all things? Answers were few and far between. Although almost six decades after the Foundation discovered the desolate town of Darrington, a new development would come to light. To be more accurate, it was 56 years later. On the 11th of January, 2017, a Foundation agent named Daniel Mitchell was patrolling the area that had formerly been Darrington, North Carolina, before the Foundation had demolished all traces of the town. By this point, the SCP Foundation had long thought that they had figured out exactly what SCP-3089 was. They had even encountered it emerging in a number of different forms in both 2007 and 2015. However, it was what Daniel Mitchell happened across during the routine monthly patrol that revealed the horrifying truth. At the outskirts of the area where the town had once been, a series of sinkholes had opened up at some point between the previous monthly check and this one in early 2017. And if you think that these sinkholes caused a disturbance in the earth and uncovered all the bodies of the former residents of Darrington, you'd be wrong. It was far, far stranger. 
The Foundation conducted a full-scale examination of the sinkholes around the demolished North Carolinian town. And these weren't just a few patches of loose ground that had sunk through. The geological survey the Foundation carried out quickly revealed that these sinkholes led to an extensive network of tunnels underground. They extended several hundred kilometers outwards, practically covering the entire underside of where Darrington had been. The tunnels seemed far too big than any other created by any natural means, but the entire network also appeared too rudimentary, too imperfect to have been carved using any modern excavation technology, like a large drill. Plus, if any equipment like that had been on site, the Foundation would have noticed, as they kept the area monitored. It was almost like something had been burrowing through the ground, only to eventually crawl back up to the surface, resulting in the sinkholes. What's more, the Foundation's geological tests suggested that the network of tunnels was almost four decades old. That would have placed the date of their creation about ten years after the disappearance of everyone in Darrington. Naturally, the Foundation immediately launched a mission to explore more of the tunnels. Before even completing a full sweep of the underground space in its entirety, they had made another discovery. Contained within the tunnels was over a whole ton of organic material that had been mostly preserved without decomposing too much. The SCP Foundation began gathering samples for testing, finding most of this material to be severely desiccated dermis tissue. That is the dense layer of skin beneath the epidermis, and it had all been entirely dried out. But that wasn't all the testing uncovered. According to genetic analysis, the tissue had two distinct types of DNA present, the first being easily identified as human genetic material, which made sense. Despite the material lacking in moisture, the dermis tissue didn't match the skin of any other mammal. But then, there was the other DNA present. Combined with the expected human DNA was the presence of something else that the Foundation researchers had quite some difficulty finding a match for. Eventually, they determined that this genetic material entangled with the human DNA belonged to the Cicadata Montana, better known as the New Forest Cicada. Cicadas, again. Cicada DNA mixed with human DNA, discovered in a large network of underground tunnels, all beneath the same town where a pastor had his congregation crush cicada shells in their left hands during one of his sermons. Ten years before the sinkhole incident, the Foundation was alerted to a particular YouTube channel by the name of Kai Sanchez Positively Rich. On the surface, Kai was one of the many online grifters preaching about how easy it was to quickly achieve an obscene amount of wealth by simply believing in yourself. Usually, if not always, these types of people were trying to scam their audience of loyal subscribers into investing in some kind of illicit money-making scheme or any number of other cons, promising their followers easy money that never came. But Kai Sanchez's channel was slightly different, so much so that the Foundation had to contain his entire audience, deeming them to have been affected by SCP-3089. The video that caught the Foundation's attention was an hour-long upload from Kai, entitled, Seven Secrets to Ascend the Ladder of Prosperity. There was that word again, prosperity, the same thing Pastor Jenner had promised his entire congregation in Darrington. And the similarities didn't end there. In his video, much like the pastor during his sermons, Kai Sanchez encouraged his audience to visualize their success in order to achieve it. He implied that the human consciousness could impact reality. For example, if his viewers just imagined themselves having a bigger bank account or looking more attractive, then these things would manifest themselves into the real world. One of Kai's secrets to ascend the ladder of prosperity was as follows. Visualize your ascendance. Reimagine yourself as someone who can reach the top of that ladder. Shed your old identity, tear it off, throw it aside like dead skin. You won't need it, not where you're going. The resemblance to Pastor Jenner's sermons was uncanny. Kai's video even encouraged that his audience leave scraps out to lure stray cats into their homes, and then, once they had one, to take a knife and well, you remember what happened in Darrington. But Kai Sanchez made sure to specify, remember to hold the knife with your left hand. Another online community was tagged by the Foundation for similar teachings. This group of insular men were trying to apply the same methodology primarily to attract women. However, they also reasoned it could be used to improve their own financial status and physical stature, all done through visualizing and believing that doing so would make these things improve that having faith would grant them prosperity. 
This disturbed community even tried to use bug rattlers to emit frequencies to aid in attracting women. Contained within these rattlers were the preserved remains of cicadas. Male cicadas have timbals, structures on their outer shell that emit a loud hissing, chittering noise that they often use to find a mate after spending so much time dormant underground before burrowing up to the surface. And if you've been paying attention, you might be able to guess exactly where this is going. SCP-3089 is a phenomenon that occurs within communities of people who are seeking some form of prosperity. Whether that community be a town, a group of like-minded people online, or any other group of collected individuals, the particular type of prosperity these people are all seeking can be anything from spiritual enlightenment to financial success. The SCP Foundation does not yet quite understand exactly how SCP-3089 starts, only that the communities affected by it will attempt to achieve their chosen material success through the application of rituals, like visualizing what they hope to overcome and achieve, and practicing sacrifices. In short, these people have to believe these acts will grant them what they want. They need to be willing to go far enough to do unspeakable things. They need to have faith. Although what they don't realize is, some things can feed on that faith. They can harvest it. Before these communities realize the terrible things that they have done, or who exactly has tricked them into performing these rituals, they'll begin to undergo a horrific transformation process, known as SCP-3089-B. It begins in the chrysalis stage. Members of a community that have been affected by SCP-3089 will experience a declined state of metabolism, now classified as an instance of SCP-3089-A, their brain activity, heart rate, and body temperature will all begin to lower. Over a period of between three and six hours, these people will then suffer a change to their epidermis, the outer layer of skin. It starts to harden until it has formed a dense, brittle substance, like a shell. Next comes the second stage of SCP-3089-B, metamorphosis. Internally, SCP-3089-A individuals will develop a number of tetromas, a type of germ cell tumor that can contain several different types of tissue, such as hair, muscle, and bone. During the next two or three weeks, these tumors will expand and dissolve the person's soft tissue. Then there's the final stage, emergence. An instance of SCP-3089-A will exit its dormant state that began in the initial stage. Once they have awoken, then something exits the outer epidermal shell. It will not communicate. Some will retain remnants of internal organs, such as eyes or lungs. However, these are vestigial, no longer serving any purpose. The brain functions deviate from any normal human patterns. Having completed the process, this thing will attempt to burrow down into the soil via any means at its disposal. An outer shell digging into the soil the tunnels underneath Darrington, the genetic material uncovered below, dermis tissue with two types of DNA, a mix of human and cicada. There is something out there. It is preying on people's faith, their longing for prosperity. Then when these communities are presented with someone who can take advantage of that faith, like Pastor Jenner or Kai Sanchez, they find themselves encouraged to push their faith to its furthest limit. And then they are rewarded by becoming something else, something nightmarish. The question is, when they wake up and crawl back out from their tunnels, leaving a sinkhole in their wake, where do these cicada creatures go? The anomalous religions that the SCP Foundation has cataloged and studied over the years are many in number and bottomless in depth, with specialized paratheological researchers limiting themselves to just one or maybe two faiths diving fully into a religion of their choice and mastering its forbidden knowledge. But the Foundation is careful to make sure that those researching these faiths don't succumb to their beliefs, as many anomalous religions are dangerous to the organizations in practice, involving tasks such as making blood packs with ancient gods, or modifying one's body to better suit a divine purpose. There's some seriously nasty stuff involved in the immaterial world, almost to the point where it makes you wonder why anyone would be suckered into joining up with what appears to be, from the outside, just another cult of crazies. But let's not generalize. Religions, even those that are non-anomalous, are all strange from the outside, even if one may seem natural to you. 
but one anomalous religion stands out from all the rest as having more active followers, more history, and more documented culture than any other, and that is sarcasm. Hold on to your flesh, because today on SCP Explained, we're going to be answering the question, what is sarcasm? And hopefully, don't get distracted and ritually sacrifice you, the viewer, in the name of the Grand Carcist Ion along the way. Let's get to it, meatbags. Before we begin, it's important to note that sarcasm is an incredibly dense and deep religion, and that covering every last detail of it in a short period of time would be a Herculean, nigh-impossible task for even the most well-read Sarkic lore masters. So where would you even start? What is sarcasm? To best understand that, we're going to bring you back all the way to the beginning of human history, to the ancient world of the Eurasian continent, where sprawling empires ruled and war between them was an all-too-common occurrence. In what is now central Siberia, the Davite Empire ruled with an iron fist. The Deva were a warrior culture, with militarism, conquest, gruesome human sacrifice, and thaumaturgic magic rituals being universally consistent in their culture according to the few historical accounts available that make mention of the Empire. The Davites practiced anomalous magic, arcane rituals, and sacrifices that bolstered their power, longevity, and standing within their society. The Empire was ruled by a theocratic aristocracy called the Deva, those who were especially attuned to the anomalous world, who practiced cannibalism and thaumaturgy, and whose bodies were so warped and modified by decades of magic alteration that Foundation historians would come to the conclusion that the Deva were so divergent from modern humans that they could be considered a separate species altogether. But how the Deva relate to sarcasm remains the question, and the answer is found in the Empire's slave-owning culture. The Devites owned many, many slaves, people they had brought or taken from their lands as a sign of pure Devite power in the form of ownership over another human being. Davite city-states had massive, sprawling slave populations, and among those was a young boy by the name of Ion. Ion's appearance would be depicted over the years by Sarkic art and culture as inconclusive and varied, whether it was their gender or even the question of whether or not Ion resembled a human. The cult of personality that would crop up around Ion would be a testament to Sarkicism's eventual widespread culture. But it was here in ancient western Siberia where those seeds of sarcasm originated. According to the most prominent Sarkic texts, Ion was a slave, like many others in the Davite Empire. Born into slavery by a Davite mother and a concubine father, the circumstances of Ion's birth indicate that he was destined to be a slave from the onset. But there was something remarkable about them. Ion, in the eyes of his masters, was different from other slaves. He was intelligent, and so much so that the decision was made for Ion to serve under a Davite priestess, where he could hone his skills to serve the Empire in ways unlike the other slaves, who toiled away constructing massive public works, or died in foreign lands on the field of battle. Ion did not understand what differentiated him from others, and why he deserved such special treatment, but it was the realization that the only thing separating him from his masters was the possession of power that would serve as the basis for Sarkicism's founding doctrines. Ion watched in horror as those they knew succumbed to the backbreaking work that the Empire forced upon its slaves, and how prevalent death and destruction were among its people. Inside, Ion grew a great rage for the Davites, who flaunted their power over others in the form of slavery. He wished to transcend the physical limitations that kept him and his fellow slaves in bondage and service to the Davites. Ion knew that their masters practiced thaumaturgy, a form of magic that granted great power to its users, and in a brutal world where power is what defines who is master and who is slave, the prospects of achieving it became more important to Ion than anything else. If he could harness such power for himself, Ion could break free from the chains of slavery that kept him subservient to those Davite masters. He would achieve apotheosis, the belief that an individual could ascend to godhood through raw power and unbridled will. Over time, Ion's hatred of the so-called living gods of the Deva grew so strong that he actively began plotting their downfall. Around 1800 BCE, Ion's influence among the lowest ranks of the Empire was inescapable. He was charismatic, he was a slave, he was powerful, and he spoke of violence. 
of seizing Davite magic for himself and using it to elevate himself into power. Ion's tenets and beliefs appealed to the slave population, who also grew hungry for freedom. Ion's creed spread like wildfire and would form the basis for all Sarkic belief in the centuries that came. First, there was apotheosis, which Ion was striving to achieve, and the path to doing so was the will to power. The next belief covered that concept in depth. Ion believed that the will to power was the primary driving force of man. As an individual seeks to master all things within its domain, they exert that power onto others, and others have the ability to exert it back in opposition. Desire is the measure of power, and those with a stronger will always triumph over the weak. The next belief was the act of theophagy, a hypothetical tenet that Ion was toying with after observing the Davite religion for years. Theophagy referred to the act of sacrificial consumption of a god, and upon eating them, achieving thaumaturgical, reality-bending, and all-powerful abilities. There were many gods in the universe, and this Ion knew, but none of them were fit for him to worship. Instead, he would crave their power. As a metaphorical example of theophagy, Ion wanted nothing more than to consume the Davite Empire whole, taking its power for his own. Next, there was the idea of sacrifice. Whether it was for the sacrifice of the self for the benefit of many, or the sacrifice of many for the benefit of the individual, Ion believed, much like his masters, that ritual sacrifice was a powerful tool that could be used as a means to achieve an end. Those who commanded the sacrifice were showing their power, bringing them that much closer to apotheosis. Those who were sacrificed were experiencing strife, which would only make them stronger than before. Muscles suffer damage, but eventually heal. The mind develops toleration against hardship, such as slavery. This cycle of destruction and regeneration in strife was, according to Ion, one of the greatest tutors in the natural world. Ion's final core belief would be the most prominent outward-facing indicator of sarcasm, and that was the idea of shepherding the flesh. Ion believed that all living things descended from a single progenitor, an all-powerful god known as Yaldaba, who the sarcasts would later regard as the principal power in the universe. Yaldabaoth's relationship with sarcasm is tenuous at best with modern Sarkic cults either admiring or fearing the enemy. One thing is certain though, Yaldabaoth remains present in all Sarkic culture, even if the religion doesn't exactly worship the god itself. Yaldabaoth was a destroyer who fed upon gods, worlds, and stars, who incidentally created the entire universe and life itself as a result of its power-hungry actions. The creation stories talk of Yaldabaoth as a blind entity, driven solely by instinct, fueled by the forces of primordial chaos. As life was created as a result of Yaldabaoth's existence, it was ultimately unguided by intelligence, and its spread throughout the universe was similar to that of a germ than anything grand or divine. Ion, upon learning of these myths, came to the conclusion that the multiverse itself was only an altar that held life's existence, which was brought into reality for the ultimate sacrifice at the hands of Yaldabaoth. The entity would one day reclaim all of existence for itself, harvesting what it created and consuming it whole, as this was Yaldabaoth's nature and purpose as the ultimate being of the cosmos. Ion saw this shared ancestry among life as the key to genetic modification. As all life was derived from Yaldabaoth, it held a similar genetic code, and it would become the Sarkic rite to guide and cultivate organic matter, stealing the genes of other life forms or creating entirely new ones. Through this perversion of life, Ion felt he could ascend from something ordinary to a living god, fueled by the unending cycle of sacrifice and creation. With his radical power-hungry beliefs rapidly spreading throughout the Davite Empire, mostly among its slaves, the leading Deva became fearful of Ion. Attempts to assassinate him or usurp Ion's influence were met with failure and only fueled the mission of his followers, furthering the belief that if they were to achieve godhood, they had to overthrow the Davites, who were the most present, all-powerful beings in their lives. This all came to a head when Ion launched his final act against the Davite Empire. After years of sowing the seeds of disharmony and hate among the slave population, Ion rallied his followers and swept them up into a full-scale rebellion. In a short time, Ion overthrew the province he grew up in, fueled by the rage of his followers, who mercilessly raised the city and slaughtered the Davites like animals. Those who were present could see the inscription Ion brought to his followers, how he commanded them as if he were a living god. 
how he used the reality-bending magic of the Deva and turned it against them, with his followers utilizing anomalous warfare in a horrific, gruesome way. Flesh was turned into a weapon. Living beings were contorted and transformed into monstrosities and abominations that fueled the Sarkic war machine. Deva Thaumaturgy simply could not compete against the permeating, powerful, and unrestricted abilities of Ion's followers. Before long, the city fell before the being who had, in that moment of bloodlust and fury, achieved apotheosis. The being, who is now known as the Grand Karsist Ion. The Grand Karsist and his followers rampaged through the ancient world, felling cities and entire empires to serve as stepping stones in their path to godhood. Their weapons and armor were unlike anything else at the time, and their utilization of powerful flesh-bending magic made them unstoppable on the field of battle. The city of Aditium was established as the Sarkic Holy City, where Ion ruled as the Sorcerer King and as a living deity. Texts from this period suggest that Ion had somehow usurped control of Yaldabaoth, the Devourer itself, wearing the flesh of the Old God as a sort of armor and crafting a kingdom from its body. While the depiction is most likely only a metaphor for how much Ion resembled Yaldabaoth in philosophy and pure power, the image of a living god devouring and succeeding the Old One is a striking visual that surely empowered many Sarkists at the time. Another story from Sarkic mythology during this period is the Six Ordeals of Ion, a parable that told of six challenges that were issued to Ion by the Archons, the servants of Yaldabaoth, who challenged the newly crowned king of Editum. By enduring their trials, Ion mastered the rituals, practices, and beliefs ubiquitous to Sarkicism, and broke free from the bondage of mortal limitations. But the authenticity of this myth is debated, and the nature of the ordeals and Ion's further relationship with Yaldabaoth remains unknown. But why did the Grand Karsist Ion, with his flowing red robes and wielding his all-powerful staff, who twisted flesh and drew blood when he so much as drew breath, fall into such obscurity that his religion remains a mysterious and obscure footnote in the Foundation's archives. If the Sarkists were as powerful as these early texts state, where are they today? Why did the horrific city of Aditum, built of living organic material that stood monument to Ion's indomitable will, fall? In Sarkicism's Golden Age, from 1600 and 1200 BCE, the religion's permeation was inescapable. Like the diseases they wielded in their wars, Sarkicism spread like a contagion around the world. Everywhere they went, they assimilated tribes and villages into their ranks, fighting under the banner of Aditum and the Sarkic faith. This expanded empire would be referred to as Kalmaktama, or the Deathless. Many tried to defeat these brutal invaders, including the king of the Hittite Empire himself, but all fell before them. As the Kalmaktama Empire attempted to establish a foothold in the Mediterranean, invading and colonizing the islands of Cyprus, Crete, and Giros, for the first time in Sarkic history, the tides of war began to turn against the religion. A coalition of kingdoms were formed in response to the Sarkic threat, created by the Egyptians, Greeks, Minoans, Canites, Assyrians, and most importantly, the Mechanites, who were the followers of the Church of the Broken God. The cult of Mekane, the Broken God, had urged these kingdoms to unite against the Sarkic threat, and now united, outfitted their allies with superior Mechanite technology that anomalously enhanced the Empire's war capabilities, putting them on par with the Sarkic Death Sorcerers. And so, a great war was waged between the Kalmaktama Empire and the Coalition of Kingdoms. The details of such are largely lost to time, but the war itself was fought with the full power of the Sarkists and the Mechanites clashing with one another and its consequences left an imprint on the Earth itself. A death toll that estimates place at 20 to 30 million, mass graves, anomalous weapons, and even the deployment of giant mechanical beings created by the Mechanites known as Colossi that rampaged through Sarkic settlements and cities. Though the battle was costly on both sides, the Kalmaktama Empire fell to the coalition, and the once impenetrable city of Editum was destroyed forever. Sarkicism would fall into obscurity, and the Empire would be forgotten, possibly because it was much easier than remembering the horrors Ion subjected the world to. The Grand Karsist himself disappeared, his whereabouts unknown shortly after the fall of Editum. Some said he had ascended into godhood, leaving the world behind. Others said he was slain in battle, nothing more than a man who believed he would never die. 
The Sarkic religion was effectively extinguished from the world, never to be seen again. Or so, that's what the coalition was led to believe. Though the Empire and Editum fell, and Ion disappeared, an idea as tantalizing and powerful as Sarkicism is difficult to snuff out entirely. In reality, Sarkicism would continue in secret, in both its homeland in the Urals and among the offshoot tribes that had fought under Editum's banner. These sects of Sarkicism would practice their beliefs in their war-ravaged homeland, which suffered a great collapse, resulting in the fall of kingdoms, a crisis of refugees, and a decline of art, literature, science, and technology. Lingering disease and famine from Sarkic biological weapons spread even to the kingdoms of the coalition, resulting in an event historians refer to as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The empire that was once deathless had now fallen, but its followers remained practicing their power-craving rituals in secret and without centralization. This led to a Sarkic Dyspora, where various sects and Sarkic cults, each with culturally distinct beliefs, would crop up throughout the Eurasian continent. While the Foundation is unsure of the specifics of these cults' activities and beliefs, elements of Sarkicism would soon begin to permeate the upper echelon of society, infiltrating Carpathian cults or sought out by nobles themselves who ignored the rumors of devil worship and witchcraft to seek out Sarkic power for their courts. The tempting power that Sarkicism granted made it a popular choice to be practiced in secret by upper-ranking royals and even entire noble families. From their position of power, where they had access to knowledge, influence, and a fresh supply of sacrifices, Sarkicism endured. Over time, this would result in the formation of Sarkic Great Houses, where families practiced their own interpretation of Sarkicism, the religion that was now mutated into hundreds upon hundreds of variations and subcultures. These great houses would focus on individualism and applying their powers to fulfill their self-serving needs. Sarkicism, now decentralized completely, would spread throughout Europe via marriage as a high society of cults and magicians whose true motives for ruling their kingdoms and provinces were kept hidden behind their meaty flesh curtain of absolute secrecy. Today, the Sarkic cults persist, and their anomalies are frequently uncovered by the Foundation. Understanding them and their religion, however, is another ordeal entirely, and the majority of Sarkic history, culture, and practices are unknown to the organization. But they're still out there, in the highest ranks of urban society, in the most remote villages of the world. There will always be those who crave to wield flesh. The followers of Ion who hope to achieve apotheosis However, they may believe they can do so. Though the details remain unclear, there is one thing the Foundation has realized over its years of studying the religion. Sarkicism has, and always will, remain. Now go check out SCP-3989 The Bone Orchard and SCP-610 The Flesh That Hates for more of those squishy Sarkicists.